So we're going to be talking about the making of Flip Grip, AKA developing an indie hardware accessory. Uh, I'm Mike Choi, engineer and designer behind the Flip Grip, and uh, you can find me on most things at Mecha Choi. Uh, who am I? I just said this. I'm the designer and engineer of the Flip Grip, as you can see here. Uh, here, wait, I should probably have a way that I can read chat at the same time. All right, sweet. Hello, Amanda J. Yeah, I know. So I'm the designer and engineer behind the Flip Grip, which if you don't know what it is, I'll explain just a little bit what it is. Uh, by day, I am, look at those legs. By, the, by day, I'm a product designer and engineer. Um, so I work on lots of different types of things, um, but uh, you know, in my career, uh, you know, I've worked on robot stuff, just gadgets and gizmos and lots of different consumer electronics applications. And so this is what I do, you know, for a living. If you're coming here from my stream, I pretty much only play music on my stream, but that's not my job. <laughs> my job is actually, you know, designing products and, and, and engineering them and taking them from concept to production, which is what this talk is going to be about. Um, I do not work for Mad Cats. Um, and uh, in terms of music stuff, it's actually kind of an interesting point because um, the way that I actually met all the fan gamer people was through music. Uh, and that's kind of like a long tangent, but basically long story short, um, I used to play music at fan gamers booth at PAX East and, and sometimes PAX West. Um, and so you can see in this bottom picture here, me with the famous, the one and only Robbie Benson. I will switch back to this photo if he, if he shows up. Um, but, uh, yeah, we would play music at the fan gamer booth and that's, that was, you know, uh, my goodness. I don't know. I guess it's kind of a crazy story. Like I, I used to street perform, um, in little Tokyo playing video game music in high school. And then I remember I sent the video into office cam, which was like a fan gamer thing back in the day. And, uh, I remember I was like, Hey, look, it's me playing video game music or whatever. And then they showed it on office cam and I was like, Whoa, it like blew my mind. Uh, and then, uh, I went to college and I was on the East Coast and then my friend won a ticket to PAX East and was like, hey, want to come? And I was like, sure, I'll go. And then uh, I went and I don't know, I just wasn't super interested in all the video game e stuff, but I brought my Pianica because I was like, I don't know, maybe I'll have a chance to play you know, video game music for all these video game people. And then I, I knew that when I went to PAX East, the first place I wanted to go was the Fan Gamer booth. Because the Fan Gamer booth was always the coolest thing. And I wanted to go there and meet all the people that I had seen on Office Cam. And so I went there and uh, I was like, I don't know what was going through my mind, but I was like, hey, you, wanna, you, wanna, uh, you want some music for your booth? I don't know what I was thinking. <laughs> But uh, they were all super, super nice. And uh, I remember particularly Steve Campos, just like, he just welcomed me with open arms. And ever since then, we've, we've been friends. And uh, that's how I met them all, was through that. And then eventually I stopped doing, eventually I stopped doing the PAX East thing because the Super Soul Bros were, uh, were, were doing it. Um, and so uh, I messaged Fangamer and was like, hey, you know, I, I miss you guys. Like, let's, let's work on something together. And so that's kind of how this eventually came to be, which I'll get to later. Um, but anyway, yeah, I know exactly. He was horning in on my territory. Um, all right. So some disclaimers, let's start with some disclaimers. Okay. Shall we, I shouldn't clap. I'm sorry. Uh, first of all, first disclaimer, this presentation is heavily unrehearsed and definitely unfinished. Okay. <laughs> I had, I, I'm not gonna pretend like I didn't have enough time to work on this. I definitely had enough time to work on this, but I I just I just have a tendency to just really aim to, to I just bite off way more than I can chew, uh, especially when it comes to food. Um, second disclaimer, I am not a fan gamer employee. Do not be fooled. Do not be fooled by my Tony Kuchar designed snowboard kids shirt or my 
John K. designed Bomberman hoodie. Okay, I am not a fan gamer employee. So, if uh, if I say something incorrect, do not come after the good, hardworking people of Fan Gamer. Okay, you come to me, right over there, Mega Choi. That's right. I am not a Fan Gamer employee. Okay, so that's just let's just clear that up. All right. I am also not affiliated with Nintendo, believe it or not. <laughs> I am not affiliated with Nintendo, so that's just, you know, just, and it's, you know, these are disclaimers, they're important, okay? They're important. Um, and uh, where can you get this exclusive merch? You can get it from fangamer.com. But yeah, Fangamer's amazing. Look, if, you, if you're watching this and you hopefully already know, Fangamer's amazing. They make amazing stuff. I model it often on my channel. <sighs> my choice of fake gamer. That's correct. I am a fake gamer, not a fan gamer. And four, have fun. Most importantly, have fun. All right, that's the fourth disclaimer. I don't know why I put that there. Okay, let's get started. Now that we have those disclaimers out of the way. You ready? All right. Oh, jeez. I dropped my phone. People who are familiar with my stream knows that that happens a lot. Um, you're talking to the fan gamer. That's right. Um, all right. So, what is a flip grip? If you're watching this, you might not know. Um, I'm going to try and assume that you don't know what a flip grip is. So, let's talk about it. Uh, a flip grip is a product that I developed in collaboration with Jeremy Parrish and Fan Gamer um, about. Oh, geez. It started two and a half years ago now or no yeah a little bit a little like two and a half years ago or so uh it's a big old hunk of plastic that allows you to play switch games in vertical mode that's it that's that's all it is it's really not that complicated um you might ask yourself why would you want this uh if you don't know much about old arcade games you might be like this seems like not a thing that would be useful um, but actually you're wrong because it's very useful. Uh, and <laughs> this is my pitch. It's very useful. Okay. Um, basically the switch, right? Because you can take the controllers off. It enables you to play these vertical games, uh, in a, in a new way, right? So you can rotate the whole switch console 90 degrees and then, you know, you can play with the joy cons. Now, what if there was a way where you could put it all together so that the rails were on the other side of the switch? Well, that's what the flip grip does. And it's just a little plastic case that allows you to do that. Um, and so here, why don't, I, why don't I take advantage of my fancy setup here? Boom. And let's, uh, let's take a look at a flip grip. So this is a flip grip, as you can see here. Ooh, it's beautiful. Um, and uh, this is a switch, right? And so it just, boom, goes in like that. And you can see it's got these rails on the side. And so you take your old Man, look at how bright those Joy-Cons are. And uh, you can play any of your favorite vertical games. Like for instance, everyone's got a favorite. My favorite is an old classic known as Brain Age for the Nintendo Switch. Uh, this is a this is your classic vertical mode game here. And that's pretty much all there is to it. Um, so, you know, you don't waste... You can imagine if you had a game like this in horizontal mode, you'd be wasting a bunch of space, as you can see from this very amazing graphic that Tony Kuchar made. You can see, look at all those wasted pixels on the left graphic there. <laughs> what a waste. So, you know, the, uh, the Switch allows you to do that. All right. Enough of that. Enough of that for now. Let us proceed. By the way, if you're hearing this music, it's a little bit quiet right now, but this music is by Banshee Beat, and you know what? It's awesome. So you should go check out Banshee Beat. So that's the flip grip, uh, if you're wondering what that is. Um, and today I'm gonna be talking about it. Uh, and specifically I'm gonna be talking from about like going from making one of these what making one of something a thing to making ten thousands of a thing, right? 
um, you might be like, what, what does that mean? Don't you just make that, just do what you did for the one thing and do it a bunch of times. Well, that's incorrect. That's actually not true. Uh, you have to take into account a lot of things when you mass produce something. Um, and so that's what I'm talking about today. All right. Show us your brain age. The fans demand it. <laughs> All right. So, yeah, so I'm going to be talking about going from making one of something to making 10,000s of something. Uh, so it's going to be kind of like how it's made. But notice I have lots of asterisks here, okay? First of all, it's just some products. This Everything I'm talking about today only applies to a certain category of products, which I'll get to in a little bit. And that product category is sort of like consumer electronics, but the flip group isn't consumer electronics because there's no electronics in it. So a lot of asterisks here. If we were to think about all of products as a pie, a big old pie. Hold up. Uh, if you were to think of all the products as like one big old pie, right? You got all the different kinds of products that there are. For instance, um, you've got planes, right? You've got snacks. Uh, consumer electronics is this pie in the corner here. It's pie slice. Clothes right? What I'm talking about today won't apply to a lot of these other categories. So let's, uh, let's dive deeper into the slice that we are talking about today, which is consumer electronics. That's my area of expertise. You know, fan gamer can tell you about how clothes are made. I don't know. How, I don't know about that. Um, I know a little bit about how snacks are made, but not a ton, not enough to speak, not enough to speak confidently about it. Uh, so within this consumer electronics slice, right, there's lots of other categories that we could talk about that we're probably not going to talk about, right? You've got cell phones, uh, you got cooking technology and robots, right? These are all different parts of consumer electronics. Some of these things I've worked on in my career, but again, we're going to focus even more into this blueberry, which is a part of this blueberry pie here. And we've got video game accessories, okay? So we've got stuff like this Xbox controller. Uh, you've got this Game Boy thing that enhances your screen. And then you've got this very specific category called non-electronic console reorientation peripherals. And that is the category that the flip grip falls into. What just happened? Oh, yeah. Uh, so... You know, there's also also Nintendo Labo kind of falls within that category, but uh, I'm not going to be talking about that today. So, uh, yes, I'm talking about a very specific type of product, um, but a lot of the lessons and insights that I'm talking about, they can be applied up the chain. So, you know, some of these things they can apply to, like if you were making a, a robot or a cell phone or something at scale, maybe not planes or clothes but this category, this pie slice. Uh, and so like, I'm not going to pretend like the flip grip is like this perfect example of like how everything is made, but it, uh, a lot of the lessons because of its simplicity, a lot of the lessons do kind of, uh, they, they apply for, for other product development efforts. All right. So let's talk about it. How do you, how do you make something like the flip grip? Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to talk uh, about the product development process as a whole. Like, what does it take to get from a product from like idea all the way to production? And like, what are the steps? And I'm going to very, very much oversimplify it. Okay. Yeah. There's another disclaimer for you. Uh, I'm going to very much oversimplify it, but that's just for the purposes of this presentation. Um, so the product development process, you can generally think of it as a timeline that looks sort of like this. It starts with an idea. Then you have to design that idea. You have to build it and test it, and then you have to ship it. Now, if you go to like, if you take a product development course or, or, or whatever, you learn it for reals, they have lots of acronyms and much more steps in here. I got rid of all those because they're confusing and I just want to make this very simple. And uh, you know, this might be unfamiliar to you, but I think that it actually is really similar to something that we all learn about. I think we all learn about in, in uh, like elementary school, right? The scientific method, right? Question, research, hypothesis, experiment, conclusion. It's not like one-to-one -one mapping, but that sort of 
mindset is 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 similar um and so uh you think about kind of going through this and like coming up with a question which is sort of like coming with an idea designing an experiment building something and then learning from it and then kind of doing that over and over again and so like this product development process it's not linear either like it doesn't just go in a straight line you're sort of doing this whole process uh, over and over again and iterating within each step of the way. So like you can imagine going through an enti- entire idea design build and test cycle just in the idea section. I know this is really abstract. I'll get to like specific examples about this later, but uh, you can kind of think of it this way. And in many cases, the way that you're the way that you're doing this process is your I said process again. The way that you're doing this process is sort of through the scientific method. Like you're making a hypothesis about what kind of designs will work and and, and how you'll make them. Okay. So we're going to talk about pies again. I got to get a drink for water. All right. So if you think about a product as a pizza and all the different components of this pizza. There's lots of different components, some of which I am not qualified to talk about. (laughs) You can think of uh, the part that's most obvious to me is the engineering part, right? Like the actual building of the thing and all the technical aspects related to that. There's the business aspect of it, like how much does it cost? How much does it cost to make? All these sorts of things. What what price do you need to sell it at so that you actually make money? Um, There's the design, which is like, how does it look? How does it feel? How do users feel about it? Like, um, you know, are you being thoughtful about how this thing interacts with its users? And then there's this other part, which is cheese here. It's called product. I, I kind of think of that as like, it's someone who's thinking about the big picture and how all these things come together and making sure that you're thinking about like the end, the end customer and the end user. Um, so like I said, I'm really most qualified to talk about engineering and design. These other two things, You know, they come into play, but in this presentation, but I'm not going to talk as much about those. Um, Within engineering, which in this case is a is a ball of dough. um, There's lots of different aspects of engineering products, right? There's a mechanical aspect, right? This mechanical engineering, it's like the physical guts of the thing, the electrical aspect, which is all the electricity and electrons running around inside of it. There's firmware, which is all the code that makes the actual thing work. There's the system, which is like how if it integrates into a larger system or you have to think about how this um, <clears throat> how this product gets manufactured and like all the different mechanical, electrical form or all these things and how they have to kind of fit together, right? There's lots of different aspects of, of engineering when you're engineering a product. Luckily, we don't need to worry about that with the flip grip because the flip grip is purely mechanical. Uh, it is just a hunk of plastic. Um, <clears throat> and so a lot of the learnings that I'm talking about, they're not gonna apply to how you would do things for electrical firmware systems. So all these other aspects of, 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 of engineering a product. Um, and that's because, like I said, the Flickr is purely mechanical, right? If you don't know what any of that stuff means, here's a little illustration to help you understand. So the flip group is purely mechanical, right? It's just a piece of plastic. If it was electrical, if it had an electrical component, imagine the flip group had a flashlight on it and you could turn that flashlight on and off. There's an electrical component, there's electrons you know, moving inside of this device. Now we need to have power. We need to have a battery. We need to have like an LED for this flashlight, right? <clears throat> and then if I wanted to make it even more complicated, right? Imagine the flip grip was a multimedia combination, personal assistant phone iPod uh, that was running a rich suite of, uh, of apps that live on this ecosystem. Uh, that would be much more complicated, right? So that would have far more aspects involved and how you drive the screen and how you show pictures on it and, and software, all the apps that run on it, all these sorts of things. So if the flip grip was like that third one, then my life would be a lot harder. Uh, and you might look at this and say, Mike, that's ridiculous. What is, what is this? What is this third image? It's cursed. Well, <clears throat> believe it or not, a more complex version of the flip grip is not, uh, also I noticed that this third one is like slightly lower than the other ones. Um, The concept of, whoops, the camera's all messed up now too. Look at this live editing of my presentation. Um, 
the idea of like a more complicated flip grip is not that outlandish. Like, as you can imagine, right, it would be really cool if we lived in a world where the flip grip had a built-in battery pack that allowed you to play for, you know, extended amounts of time while you're on the go. It had a USB slot where you could plug in a USB and it would automatically start charging the switch and the Joy-Cons. Uh, you know, that would be really cool. Disclaimer, this is not a real product, okay? This will probably never be a real product, at least not one that I make. But <clears throat> when you're coming up with a design or an idea for a product, right, it's really tempting to look at a product like this and say, hey, wouldn't it be cool if we could add this, we could add this, we could add this, all these different features, right? But as you can imagine, that necessitates you adding a bunch of these different subsystems and a bunch of these different complications to your product. It's really tempting because you think of it and you're saying, I want to make the coolest product possible. I want to make uh, a product that will just, you know, have all these crazy features and all these sorts of things. Um, but the problem with that is that all of those features can prevent you from actually getting to a place where you could ship your product, right? Like, imagine product development is like uh, an iceberg, okay? So... I'm on a ship and I look at this iceberg and I say, wow, look at that little, little harmless iceberg. Okay. That little harmless iceberg tip is a seemingly tractable product feature. That's what I wrote. <laughs> so let's say it's like, oh, I want a battery in my flip grip or something like that. Um, but what lies below the surface friends? Mo problems. That's right. Think about all the different complexities that come with adding product features to your product, like cost and integration, right? Every time you add another subsystem, you have to think about how those two subsystems work together uh, or three subsystems or four subsystems or whatever it is. Um, you have to think about the complexity of like actually executing it and taking it to market, all these different things that make it more complicated. Um, so, uh, I found that in general, um, a very helpful thing to think about when you're making a product like the flip grip, let's say, is to think about like, what is your goal? What is your goal? And really our goal for the flip grip is pretty simple. It's to enable on the go vertical gaming. That's it. Nothing else. It's not to charge people's switches or to do all these other things. It's just let's enable on the go vertical mode gaming. Um, and this is really important because when you're solving a problem, it doesn't even need to be an engineering. It could be any kind of problem, right? Uh, it's really helpful to just think about the one problem that you want to solve and ignore all other problems. Think about the one or two or three problems you want to solve and ignore everything else because they will stop you from being able to fully, uh, solve the most important thing at hand. Um, and so... Uh, imagine, oh, oh, here we go. I can put this little animation here. You got to be laser focused on the problem that you want to solve. In this case, I'm laser focused on vaporizing this flip grip with my laser vision. I wish I could say, I wish I could say, folks, that I came up with this, but my good friend, Carrie, who's here, uh, aka Borgel, he was the one who gave it similar presentation on our product that he developed and I stole this from him. The idea of like focusing on the one problem that you need to solve. Um, so that's really important. Uh, you know, in our situation, right? All we wanted to do was enable on the mo on the go vertical mode gaming. Um, now when it comes to figuring out your goals, everything else kind of falls out from that. Um, for me, the goal was I wanted to make this thing really good, which means I should try and just focus on making that vertical mode gaming experience like really good, like really nailing that. I don't need to add any of these other features because that's just going to distract me. I'm just one guy designing this, right? So I need to stay focused on the problem at hand and everything else, everything else will kind of uh, just distract me from being able to figure out how to get on the, mo on the go. I just keep saying on the mo, on the go vertical gaming, uh, really good. Um, if I keep it simple, it also makes it cheaper. If I don't add a battery, if I don't add all these other components, right. 
And that makes the flip grip more accessible and makes it so that more people want to buy it and uh, makes it so that more people can have access to it. Um, and so, um, and of course, all these things lend itself to actually finishing and shipping the product, which is really the most important part, right? It doesn't matter if I add all this cool feature, all these cool features to it. If they keep me from actually being able to ship the product at the end of the day, it, none of it matters, right? And so, uh, keeping like the goal very simple early on was a big goal of, was, was a big uh, priority for me. Um, and, uh, yeah, so that's just kind of an overview of like product development as a whole and kind of like some of the philosophy going into the flip grip. Let me just catch up on chat real quick. I know this does this does exude pick two. I, I this this is not a this is not a finished slide. I was gonna put a bunch of cool stuff on it. Um but this is just like kind of describing sort of what falls out of having a really simple product goal. Um my my goal in life is to have a good cheap ship. Exactly, eeks. Exactly. So with that in mind, let us begin the journey. Are you ready? The journey of flip grip, okay? So <clears throat> remember this product development process, we're going to go through that journey with flip grip and we're gonna learn some stuff along the way. Um, so the idea, it all started on April 13th, 2017, okay? That fateful day, someone who you may know named Jeremy Parrish, that's right, published an article on Retronauts.com. We really need a Nintendo Switch Tate mode grip attachment. Uh, this, is, this was on April 13, 2017. He just posted it on the internet. Uh, and he posted this little screenshot here where he says, can I get a heck yeah from the choir? We're family friendly here, okay? Heck yeah from the choir. Uh, and let's, let's, let's read what he says. He says, I doubt this peripheral would see a ton of use but I also suspect we'll be seeing enough classics with Tate mode support to make it worth peop many people's while. Heck, someone with more confidence in CAD, that's computer-aided design, CAD software than I, could have, could probably bang out the, could probably bang out of these out with a 3D. <laughs> I'm critiquing Jeremy Parrish's uh, writing on, on stream right now. I'm sorry, Jeremy. I'm sorry. Okay, if you're watching, uh, I'm sorry. Okay, I got confused. Uh, Heck, someone with more confidence in CAD software than I have could probably bang one of these out with a 3D printer in the space of an afternoon. So anyway, you, the peripheral makers of the universe, may have this idea for free. All I ask is that you send one along for a Retronauts review once you've created it. This was back in April, tw April 13, 2017. I did not see this article, okay? So he was not talking to me. Um, then, I guess... Nobody decided to do anything about this uh, because then the next step in this timeline is, is uh, several months later on November 14th, 2017, I, uh, I got a, f a, fate a fateful email arrived in my inbox, okay, from none other than the man himself, Reed Young, and the title of the, of the email was Baki the Grippler. <laughs> <clears throat> so this email was to me and to Jeremy, and uh, I couldn't believe it because I saw, first of all, I saw Reed Young's name in my inbox and also Jeremy Parrish's name in my inbox, and I was like, what the heck is happening? Um, this is probably spam. Just kidding. I didn't think that. Uh, so this was on November 14, 2017, and Reed was basically reaching out to me because I guess uh, Jeremy had reached out to Reed and said, hey, I want to make this product a reality. And Reed says, hey, I know just the guy. I know just the guy. And so Reed reached out to me uh, to see if I wanted to collaborate, which, of course, I wanted to. And so, you know, this idea is very exciting. And uh, this was at, what, 12.58 p.m. So I was, I was very excited at this time, you know, two and a half years ago. All right. So, like any good action movie, all three forces combined Jeremy Parrish Mike Choi and Fangamer of course 
And so we all joined forces, and in that email thread, Jeremy shared um, one of his sketches early on uh, for the flip grip and kind of how he thought that it could do it. And you can see here he's got a couple ideas for how to do the battery and how to have USB-C pass-through. Um, he also, as you can see from his article, he, like, put a mock-up of it. Um, and so, uh, you know, he's been thinking about kind of how to how, how this how this would be implemented. Then I kind of put my input into it. This is one of my sketches from that thread. Um, just kind of trying to figure out different ways to, as you can see, it's very different from what the flow group ended up being. Um, and so I was really excited by this idea. I was excited just at the idea of, of, of collaborating with Fangamer and Jeremy, um, but also obviously for the idea of making a, a the Switch, which is already like enables so many different ways of playing games, adding onto that functionality even more. Like to me, that was a really cool idea. Uh, and so really the next step is to just 3D print everything, right? That's like the easiest way. Just hit the ground running and just start 3D printing, right? You're wrong. That wasn't the next step, okay? You might think, oh, <laughs> sorry. I'm, I started that sentence very, uh, uh, very in a very confront, co confrontational manner. You might think that at this stage in the process, it's just about, oh, well, hey, we've got some sketches, we've got some ideas, let's just start printing grips and trying them. <clears throat> Which eventually we did, as you can see from this stack of grips. Um, but a really important, another important lesson for product development is uh, this motto, which again, I did not come up with this motto. <laughs> it's called build less faster. And so <clears throat> once we have a sketch like this, right? Like it's nice to have sketches and everything, but you wanna try something, right? You wanna like, for me anyway, when I'm in this mode, I'm like, wow, I wanna build something. I wanna print something immediately. Um, but printing things and designing things and, and, and actually fabricating them takes a lot of time. And so <clears throat> at this stage in the process where you're in the idea phase, it's really good to kind of take a step back and really try and think of as many possibilities as possible on paper before going through and actually making something because that takes a lot of time. And if you are able to think through your designs without actually making them, then you can keep yourself from having to build things that you didn't need to build or uh, waste resources or time designing something that maybe you could have just ruled out on paper. So that's kind of the idea behind build less faster. Um, hold up. By the way, the title of this email, Baki the Grippler, that's all Reed Young. <clears throat> but that name uh, would become immortalized because I started to use it as the actual code name for the project. And so there's a lot of, um, <clears throat> there's a lot of uh, like production documents that actually say Baki on it, which is pretty funny. So, <clears throat> So, like I said, it's really helpful early on in a process like this to just uh, vet out designs on paper without actually um, without actually making them. And so that's exactly what I did. And I would call this phase the, the it's a fancy word. It's the architecture phase. This is when we're kind of still trying to figure out well, what is the flipper going to look like? What you know, where should the Joy Cons be? Right, as you can imagine, this right, this picture, it looks like a flip curve, doesn't it? Read as much point three. I didn't make that. Reference. I don't know. I didn't know what it was at the time. I remember googling it after I got that email and being like, "What is this?" Um. Hey, what's up, Key Fry? Also, hi, Laura. Um. Also, Laura, I just want to say, this this might be weird, but I remember when I first saw pictures of of Baki. Some of the ones that I saw online, it reminded. It, I, I don't know why, but it it looked like Charlie to me. I don't know. Okay. I, I just had to say it. Uh, that's the first thing that went through my mind. I was like, that looks like Charlie. Um, anyway, maybe it was like some fan art or something. Anyway, so this image here, right? It looks like a flip grip, right? It looks like a flip grip just sitting on a table, right? But this is actually not a flip grip. It's just a switch next to two Joy-Cons. You can see if you look really closely, it's not even in the flip grip orientation. Uh, so... Why is this sitting on a piece of paper? Well, because for me, build less faster in this situation meant let's just actually place all these components on a piece of paper and just sketch out all the different options. So 
here's this is this is I literally did this. You can see the time I have the timestamps here. November 14, 2017. This was the day <laughs> that I got this email. All right, so we're moving fast. We're moving really quickly here. So, you know, I'm taking all these different orientations of the switch, the Joy-Cons, where you can place them, and taking into consideration all the different like trade-offs of these different things, right? Imagine if I went through and I made a prototype for every single one of these. It would have taken a lot longer than me just sticking it on a piece of paper and drawing it out, right? Um, and so in this situation, building isn't really building at all. It's actually not building. I know that's very big, but so, you know, look at all these different configurations. I tried a bunch of these different ones and, and took into consideration all the different features um, and I actually arranged them in a decision matrix like this, which is also just really helpful to think through all the different trade-offs. I also gave them cool code names. They weren't all just called Baki, uh, Toasty, Coolio, The Chin, and Dumbo. These are all the different kind of features that uh, would be, uh, you know, obscured or not obscured in certain configurations. Um, and so you can see, like, I was taking into consideration how many heat vents were covered, uh, whether or not the card slot was covered, whether or not volume was covered. Uh, and, you know, as you can see here, like, from this, from this matrix, it's not entirely clear which one is the best option, actually, uh, because you're making trade-offs. And that's what engineering is about. It's about like making these different trade-offs. You can't have everything, so you have to pick certain amounts of things. You have to pick some things and let go of others. And it's about making the most informed decision possible. And so doing sketches like this is, is really helpful early on um, because I was able to do this all literally as soon as I got home after getting that email. Um, and so, you know, this is, I like to think of the, product development process like it's kind of like this breathing thing where it's sort of this area where you're diverging and so you're trying lots of different things and then you try to converge and so you you narrow down those things to like a certain amount of concepts right and at the end of the day I end up just shipping one flip grip or like one design anyway and so that's like the convert the divergence and the convergence you know I, I know that sounds kind of floaty but whatever um, tag yourself exactly the chin so, uh, after doing this sort of architecture layout, I was convinced of two designs that I wanted to try. And so this is when we enter into the design phase. Uh, Baki V1. Like I said, Baki is the code name going forward, okay? So Baki V1, gather feedback. The goal of Baki V1 is to gather feedback on architecture. Every time I make a prototype, I'm gonna show you the goal that we were going for with making the prototype, right? There's no point in making a prototype if you're not going to learn something from it or gather some information or, or do something with it. And so it's really important to know what your goals are. That's going to be a very important theme of this going forward. So <clears throat> this was a sketch for the first, uh, for the first flip grip, for the first Baki prototype. Um, I'm not going to call it flip grip. This isn't flip grip yet. Okay. It's not yet there, but this is, this is pre flip grip. So this is Baki V1. As you can see, this is on November 15th. So like I said, we're moving really fast. The way that I was going to construct this one was using a, uh, a central piece of plastic that I was going to 3D print, that I was going to design and 3D print. And uh, I was going to attach two Joy-Con rails to it. I was going to gut those Joy-Con rails from that little uh, sled that comes with all the switches. I was just going to take the rails out of that and stick it on there just to like, I knew that those are going to work, right? <clears throat> I know that they're going to fit well on the switch and or on the joy cons. And so I, you know, I was just going to stick them on there. Um, and I was going to use the screws. And so this is a picture of the CAD. As you can see this is November 15th. This is a picture of me at one point in the 3d printing process where I'm curing them. All right. See you later, Josser. <clears throat> um, and, uh, this is me UV curing them to make sure that they're at like optimal mechanical uh, properties. And then this is what the actual prototypes ended up looking like. So this is Baki V1 A and B. And I forget which architectures these were testing, um, but essentially this was, hey, let's try and uh, let's try and uh, test a couple of these different architectures and start getting feedback on it. Um, by the way, one thing that I forgot to mention um, when I received this email from Reed, I, the, actually the first thought that crossed my mind was someone has definitely done this already. That's what I thought. I thought someone must have already gone through and, you know, there's all kinds of 3d printing repositories on the internet and people designing stuff all the time. <clears throat> 
Someone's done this already, <clears throat> surely. Um, but then I went, as soon as I got that email from Reed, I went and I looked at every 3D printing repository that I could, I could find. And uh, I couldn't find one. No one had done it yet, which I couldn't believe. And at that moment in this story, I was filled with an overwhelming sense of urgency that if no one has done it yet, I need to be the one to do it and I need to be first. <laughs> so that's why I moved so fast and that's why it's so important that all this stuff in here is very efficient. Also because I had a day job, like, you know, I don't have all the time in the world to do this. Um, and so you need to be efficient for that reason, but also because I was like, oh my goodness, someone else is going to come out with this, you know, mad cats or someone is going to just like make it and, and, you know, put it out in the market. And so I wanted to move very, very fast. Um, and so, uh, that's, that's why, that's why you'll see this timeline moves pretty quickly. Um, so this is Baki V1 and, uh, here's a little video. I made these, man, this is a throwback. I would make these demo videos for the fan gamer crew. So this is the first one. I remember I made this over a long weekend. It might have been Thanksgiving. I don't remember. Is that right? I don't even know what the dates for Thanksgiving are. I just remember it was a long weekend and uh, <laughs> Mad Catch to make a flip group that's four feet wide. Yeah, so you can see me kind of demoing it and talking about the different aspects of it. And you can see the, uh, you can actually see like the metal rails on the side here. Look at that. I think I ended up just gluing them in. I didn't even screw them in. This is all about build less faster. You know, like I don't, I just need to get the point across and just try it. I just wanted to try it as soon as possible. So I don't need to make it super fancy. Um, and in fact, I actually don't know if I have any of these prototypes. I think I might've given these prototypes to fan gamer people. Um, but yeah, you can kind of see this video here. Anyway, so the, the general construction of this, um, the general construction of this particular prototype was a main grip, left rail, right rail, and then four fasteners. So it was a total of seven parts, um, which, you know, it's not that complicated, right? You open up a Joy-Con, which we'll do later. And there's like lots of parts, right? Um, but uh, <laughs> Flup Grup is the name we use for defective flip grips in the office. I want to hear more about that. <laughs> I want to know more about those defective flip grips. Um, they need love too. So yeah, so this is a total of seven parts, this architecture. Um, and again, I picked these. I picked these rails because I knew that they would work, right? I knew that they would get the feeling across, and like I didn't need to worry as much about like, oh, this 3D print it doesn't feel quite right. Like I don't know. But the problem with this design is that it's seven parts, and as you can imagine, making something with less parts is cheaper than making something with more parts, and it's less complex, and it's less all these things. So I was thinking to myself already at this stage, like, is there a way that I can make this less complex? Is there a way I can use less parts? Maybe less screws. Maybe, uh, maybe I only need two screws. Uh, maybe I can do some fancy stuff in the plastic. So I only need one, I only need one screw on either side. Uh, so what were the lessons that I was learning from this? Uh, uh, one of the lessons that I learned from this, every, every prototype we're learning a bunch. So I'm going to have these little like lessons. Put your phones on silent people. Who's calling me right now? Um, oh, that stopped the music. Okay. Um, every pro every prototype, like I said, we're learning stuff from it. So we're gathering feedback. I'm sending it to fan gamer. I'm sending it to Jeremy. We're like, you know, we're trying it. We're getting feedback on it very early on in the process. And so in this particular, with this prototype learned stiffness is really important. Like if this thing doesn't feel stiff, you're going to be able to just like, it's going to feel very low quality. You'll be able to pop the switch out. It's like very, it's, it's, it's very, uh, feels low quality, right? It's not a good product. Um, Another thing that I learned is exposing the USB sl slot, which was like very desirable, right? In theory, you're like, hey, I wanna be able to charge this thing on the go. Just like the way that this works with the proportions, once you actually plug in that chunky switch charger into that slot, even if I lower the Joy-Cons the way that I do in this architecture, it's still really unpleasant to play with that charger in, uh, in that slot. So even exposing it, doesn't necessarily fix the problem. And then I would need to lower the Joy-Cons more and then weight distribution would become an issue. And so this, these are the sort of things that I was learning as we were, uh, you know, putting together these prototypes. And of course, most importantly, you know, is there some way that we can reduce the number of parts that this thing is using, right? Uh, 
like I said, like using less screws. So the idea that I had for V2 was less parts, less complex. Can we make it like, what do, what do I want to learn with this prototype? Can, is there a way that I can make it cheaper, basically? Um, it's already so simple, right? Seven parts. How can we make it any less simple? Or any, 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 how can we make it any simpler? <laughs> how can we make it less simple? That's not what I want to do. Um, so uh, in order for us to proceed, you need to have an understanding of, a, a base level understanding of a process called injection molding which is the manufacturing process, spoiler alert, that we used for the flip grip. Um, so we're gonna do a really fast intro to injection molding. So if you think about injection molding, it's, uh, it's, it's used in many different things, like the Joy-Cons are injection, like uh, uh, many of the components and the, the mechanical components in the Joy-Con are, are injection molding, injection molded. Uh, this, this mouse, the casing for it is injection molded. Um, the flip grip is injection molded, right? It's a really good way of making lots of something very, very cheap um, and uh, out of plastic or sometimes metal, but I'm not gonna get into that right now. So <clears throat> I tried to put together this explanation of how injection molding works. It's not great. There's a lot of really good resources online to see how injection molding works, but uh, I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna give it a go. So. What you're looking at here is a cross section of a mold. So these are two big old pieces of metal uh, that have shapes carved into them. So there's a core and a cavity, which is basically just two halves of a mold, right? It's kind of like think about making chocolate or, or something like that. And you, you pour hot chocolate into a mold and then it cools and it comes out. That's basically what injection molding is. <clears throat> so you slam those two halves together. <clears throat> Excuse me. You slam those two halves together you inject molten plastic into it, and then it fills up the cavity on the inside. Then you wait for it to cool, you separate the mold, and then there are these little pins at the bottom that shoot out the part, and then you have your part. <clears throat> That's injection molding. It's, 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 it's really not that complicated. I mean, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of ways that you can make it more complicated, but at a high level, that's kind of how, how injection molding works. <clears throat> all the food talk. Yeah, that's right. I'm going to use a lot of food analogies in here. Now, there's a couple of rules to injection molding, but like the really important one is that, as you can imagine, this part needs to be able to come out of the mold, right? Like in this particular situation, it's really easy for the part to come out. It just You just pull it out, right? But <clears throat> in most... Exactly. That's what the circle outlines are on plastic stuff. They're ejector pins. That's 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 exactly right, Sako. Um, so, one rule about injection molding is that you need a design that can get pulled out of the mold. As you can imagine, if I want to do something like this, which as you can imagine is sort of what a flip grip looks like from head on, right, with those little rail slots, you wouldn't be able to pull this out. Like, think about trying to get this out of the mold. Like, it would not be possible because this piece of steel, this piece of metal, would hold on to the part. Like, you'd have to really pull on this thing to get it out, and you'd probably break the part, right? <clears throat> Why does this matter? Well, if you think about the shape, this little T shape, right? This little T slot shape, that's the shape that you need to hold on to a flip grip or uh, to hold on to a Joy-Con, right? Like the little little rail here, right? You need to be able to hold on to it with this. Actually, I'm gonna, I'm gonna probably switch to this larger view. Hey, what's up, Guabs? <clears throat> Guabs, thanks so much for the raid. Hey, check this out. Hey, what's up, Dom? Um, look, Guabs, you're in this presentation. Welcome, Raiders. I'm in the middle of a, I'm in the middle of a talk, a very deep talk on product development <laughs> and the making of flip grip. <clears throat> Excuse me. Let me clear my throat. I have not talked this much in a long time. Yeah, we're gonna be talking about flip grip. Um, so this little T-slot shape is really important, right? Like, let's look at, um, let's look at, here, I'm gonna get rid of this here, and then we're gonna, we're gonna talk with the camera. 
I don't know if you've ever looked really closely at how Joy-Cons work, but when you look at them on the Switch, right, they have this little rail. This rail has space underneath it to hold on to this opposite rail, male rail, female rail. Okay, so you stick it in there. Mm, feels so good, and that's how it doesn't come out, right? Because it's being held on. That's why you can't just yank on it and pull it out. You have to slide it out this way, right? And that's what we need for the flip grip. But the way that Nintendo does it is they have this one rail with like four screws or five screws. Yeah, so there's a lot going on here, and there's a good reason why they did that. But for the flip grip, I wanted to figure out, is there a way that we could simplify it? That was the goal of Baki V2. So this is not Baki V2, but this gets the point across. What I was able to do with Baki V2 is I was able to basically go from seven parts to one part. I'm gonna say that again. With Baki V2, the goal was to reduce part count. So the magic sauce of flip grip and why it's so affordable, these are the, these are the secrets of the trade. The reason why it's so affordable is because of Baki V2. This idea to basically take the rails and remove them, the screws, remove them, and do it all in the way that the plastic is molded. And as you can see, the, this looks a little bit weird. Like, why isn't this rail going all the way on both sides the way that it does on uh, on the switch, right? If you like, look at the side of the switch, right? It goes all the way up on both sides. On this side, you can see it's staggered. Like this part, it's together. Then this part's like that, this one just like that. Basically, all you need to know is that this is how it needs to be so that I can actually make it as a single part. And what does that buy us? That means that we don't need to assemble anything. We don't need to buy any screws or buy any rails or make any rails. We don't need to pay anybody to assemble them. It just, when it comes out of this injection molded press, it's done, it's ready to go. That's a little bit of an oversimplification, but you know, it's, it's basically done. Um, and so that was like the, that was like the aha moment for flip grip was figuring out how to do it uh, with, with no assembly required as all one part. Uh, if that's like the one thing that you take away technically from this talk, <laughs> it's that that was like a really big deal. Uh, I tried to do an illustration of it here. It's not super great. Oh shoot. I'm not even presenting. Um, yeah. So like once the flip, like, so you can think of this as a flip grip, like, it gets shot out of the mold and then it's basically done. Like it's basically good to go. So the difference be here being is like that we are recreating the rails with just plastic parts. And um, that requires a lot of really clever mold design and, and mechanical design, which I won't get into right now, but um, yeah. So that was a big deal. Um, <laughs> thanks, Steve. Um, and uh, another thing about V2 was uh, increasing stiffness, right? Like stiffness we found out from V1 is really important. And so uh, you can see in this demo video I'm talking about, oh, look, I made this, I made it so that we no, lo no longer need these parts. I'm just gonna show you IRL. So like the first flip grip prototypes, they didn't have, the first Baki prototypes, they didn't have this this bottom part. And so you could just like, whoops. Yeah, these, these are really old. So they're very brittle, <laughs> don't worry. I have lots of them. I have a lot of prototypes. Look, I have even more. Um, but basically like, imagine this just not having this, actually this is actually a pretty good demo now. So now that it doesn't have this black, this, this bottom part, right? Like this is really bendy. Not good product feel people. Um, so adding that little bottom part significantly increases the stiffness and makes it feel like, you know, solid quality product. Yeah, I know this is, this is, this is upsetting, but this is, look, you got to break stuff. Okay. I have a lot of these prototypes. Trust me. There, it, there's no shortage. There's no shortage. Um, so, uh, okay. So this is the demo video me showing kind of like, Hey, this is also when I introduced the, the, the symmetry nub. So I don't know if you saw that there, but basically, um, there's this little bit in here that makes it so you can't insert it the wrong way. This little, it's kind of hard to see, but like there's a little, there's a little piece in there that makes it so that you have to register on this corner of the switch. 
Um, the creator destroys what he created. Yeah, it's just a prototype. It's just a prototype, okay, people? Don't worry about it. Um, okay, so Baki V2. What do we learn from Baki V2? Adding a big old rib at the bottom is good for stiffness, which is good for product feel, which makes people feel like this is like a high quality product, right? The second, the second and most important thing that we learn is we don't need no stinking rails. We don't need no stinking fasteners. Um, but one thing that we also learned from Baki V2 was that uh, we need a really good way to hold on to the switch to keep it from falling out, um, which is ends up being pretty tricky. Um, so that informs our next prototype. Yokotara still managed to. Um, all right. So Baki V3. The goal of Baki V3 is how to hold on to the console. Uh, this was, if I'm being perfectly honest, probably one of the more challenging things, and one of the things that I think I would have, I would probably solve differently if I had to do it over again. Um, Baki V3 with zero parts. Um, so. Basically, let's see. Let's see if I have a couple different demos of this because um, I didn't really have time to make slides for this part. So I tried a bunch of different retention features. Like here's a prototype. As you can see, it's pretty early on. There's not even a flippy on the back. Uh, like a little, oh, the music stopped. Got to turn it back on. This music is so good. Um, hey, what's up, Holly? I won't break this one. I won't break this one. So you can see here, I had just like a little bit of rubber to register on this feature on the switch to try and hold it. Like, look at look at how horribly warped these parts are now. This is what happens to 3D prints over time, um, certain types of 3D prints, but so it's like not usable, but it gets the point across. So I was like trying lots of different ways to hold onto the... Um, to hold on to the switch. Uh, here's what Baki, this is actually, I believe this is actually Baki V2. So this one, I was using this little, this little, oh man, you can't really even see it. I'm so bad at this. Uh, this little like cantilever, you see that? And so that would locate and hold on to that little portion of the switch, right? But I don't really like that. Like, cause basically you just had to yank the switch out, which I, I didn't like. Um, I wanted something that was a little bit more intentional um, and so I decided to use this design, which is basically the design that ended up shipping on the flip grip, which is basically this like cantilever portion that um, you pull up on. Cantilever is a fancy word for like a diving board, a diving board. Um, here, why don't I find like a real flip grip and explain like that. Here we go. So you pull up on this portion, and then that disengages with the uh, that disengages with the. It's locating on this little vent here. You put it in. It's located. It's not coming out. And then you just pull on this to pull it out. Right. So that is basically the retention feature that we decided on. Now, why am I talking about this? Why am I talking about this? And what's like the less? What's the big like design takeaway? This, this one this one's a little bit difficult for me to, to explain, but the design of this little diving board. In mechanical design, there's this concept of designing things as steel safe, which is basically a fancy way of saying, make it so that you can adjust it later. Um, and by design, this cantilever is adjustable um, as like a as a uh, you know, it, when it's inside of its when it when like when I eventually end up making the piece of like metal, getting the piece of metal that makes this flip grip right, I can actually go through even after I've made that big expensive piece of tooling and go through and design and adjust the length of this cantilever. But I can only adjust it in one direction, and so I should start in like the farthest possible scenario and adjust from there. I know that's confusing. Think about it this way. This is a very uh, this is a very topical uh, analogy. Uh, imagine when you're cutting your hair, right? How do you, how are you going to cut your hair? Which setting are you going to go on first? You should if you're not familiar with cutting your hair like I am, and you're trying to cut your hair during these times, which I'm trying to, and it's very difficult. 
you start long. You start with a big little haircut guard thing so that when you cut your hair off, if you mess up, you still have room to adjust it and to and to get to the place where you eventually have to give yourself a whole buzz cut. Um, but you can't go in the other direction, right? You can't add hair. I mean, I guess you can. In some ways you can. But in general, like with the pair of clippers, it only goes in one direction. It only takes hair off, right? There's something very similar happening when you're manufacturing plastic tools, which is that you can adjust, but you can only adjust in one direction. And so you want to make sure that you're, when you're designing something that needs to be adjusted or that you're unsure how it's going to turn out, you want to make sure it's on the other side of that. I know that's very cryptic. I hope that makes some sense. If you have questions about it, I can explain in more detail later. Um, but anyway, so the big takeaway there is that you're designing in this adjustability. Like this cantilever, if it's too loose, I can just shorten the diving board and then it becomes stiffer, right? Like a short diving board, as you can imagine, would be like very stiff. It'd be like walking on the ground. Whereas a much longer diving board, you're gonna feel that flex. Um, and so I start really, really long and then adjust it as necessary. And that's called designing something steel safe. Um, you can't uncut your hair, exactly. So the big takeaway there is that when you're designing something, whether it's, you know, there's analogs to this in all sorts of design, um, but especially in mechanical design, like you're building adjustability into your design, knowing that you're not gonna get it right the first time. So you wanna make sure that your design is, is such that it's adjustable, which I'll get to later. Um, and that's sort of building compliance and design. What was I inspired by? Um, Oh yeah, sorry. Yeah, building adjustability and design. That's the big point. How am I doing on time? Oh my goodness, it's been an hour. Uh, okay, we'll start picking up the pace here. It's the longest control Z ever. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so building compliance in your design is, is really important. And that's not, in this case, it's kind of a double, uh, double meaning because the actual cantilever member is compliant, right? It complies to you pushing on it, but also the design itself is compliant in the sense that it is flexible. And again, that's not supposed to be a pun. It's like actually a design that you can adjust as time goes on. Um, um, okay, so what was I inspired by? If you've ever used a Pelican case, um, <laughs> good one, Poco. Uh, if you've ever used a Pelican case, you'll notice that there's like this compliant member on the back of the Pelican case that actually locks this hand lever into, or this, uh, whatever, this suitcase, handle into place in both the top and the bottom positions. I was very much inspired by that for the flip grip. So that's just a little bit of where that was coming from. Um, here's a demonstration video of me. Uh, I think this was with two different lengths. So this is at one at the long length and one at the shorter length. And I was just kind of showing like, Hey, this is, this is how each of them feels. Exactly. You can only put the bread back in the oven. That's a good, that's a good food analogy. How are people doing? Is this going over? Is this going over people's heads, or is it like? Is it interesting? Is it? Is it? Are people enjoying it? Cool. So, the most interesting part of Baki V3, though, is not the cantilever. It's actually. Thank you, everybody. I appreciate the feedback. I'm not, just not sure. You know, people are enjoying it or not. Um, this. Is really important. This was when I had done. I, this is when I designed our favorite friend Flippy. So you can see this is actually the concept. This is the original concept sketch for Flippy. This was on the train ride home. <laughs> I put the hair in the oven. I think it's burning. <laughs> That's funny, John. You're funny. I miss you, man. I miss you, man. Hope you're doing well. Um, anyway. So this is the these these are the or this is just fun to look at. I mean this this is the original concept sketch for Flippy. As you can see, we're also trying to figure out kind of like what the name of the product will be. So like you can see, I did uh, retro Tate. We were gonna do like a retro knots Tater knot. There's all these different names for for what it would be Tater knot. I I like Tater knot, but it doesn't really make sense. It's like Tate vertical retro knot uh, and then t Tater tot. The third one doesn't really make sense, but you know, whatever. I thought it was cool. Um, retro rotate, yeah. Retro rotate was like a is 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 
yeah, it was interesting. It works better as like a slogan or something like that. But you can see I tried a bunch of different ones. And then we eventually settled on this guy, Flippy, which you can see here the sketch of Flippy that I made. And then the actual final design of Flippy that I designed in, uh, I actually designed this in, in a CAD program. <laughs> I didn't do it in, in Photoshop or anything like that. Um, that's Flippy. And uh, Flippy would go on to take on many forms uh, in the form of campaign assets and instructional materials. I had a lot of fun drawing Flippy in different scenarios was very therapeutic for me going through this process. This was a very, this was a very difficult, like, I mean, just taking a step back, like this process was extraordinarily difficult, right? Uh, and it's actually interesting because it's not really a story that I get to tell very often um, because it was really, most of it was just me in my room doing all this. Um, and so it's, it's really, I'm really grateful for the opportunity to be able to actually tell people about this, about how this was developed. Um, so yeah, Flippy was used in lots of different um, campaign assets. Yeah, you recognize this theme, that's right. That's right, I, I have a tendency to, to do this sort of thing. Um, and uh, you can see a lot of my influences for Flippy. Um, I, I, I love mascots, okay? I'm just going to go out and say I love anything. I love putting faces on things like it's just the best to me. Uh, so, you know, you can see like Discoon from the disc system, Tiny Cartridge, which is like one of my favorites. This is the 3DS settings mascot, which I don't know if anybody recognizes that. <laughs> you go into 3DS settings, there's like a little dude who like is shaped like a 3DS screen. Uh, and then Monita from... Nintendo Land. And so, you know, just like mascot influences. So, uh, yeah, so that was Baki V3. Baki V3 was the first time we actually implemented um, putting putting, uh, putting Flippy into the actual product. And then I was actually a placeholder. Like, I made Flippy... <sighs> Mike getting a taste of translator's life. Uh, I actually made Flippy as sort of uh, just a, on a one-off. I remember uh, going through the messages that I had and I was like, I don't know, I just made this as like a placeholder, like whatever, we're gonna probably make a real logo eventually. But secretly I really loved Flippy and I wanted Flippy to be the logo, but I didn't, wanna, I didn't want to get too attached. I was afraid that, you know, I don't know, someone's gonna be like, no, we have, a, we have designers who can make a, a, a mascot and you know, Flippy was gonna go away. Um, but, uh, I think everyone was like, no, Flippy looks good. Let's use Flippy. And I was like, sweet. And so it was very fun to be able to design that part of the product, which, you know, for my normal job, I wouldn't do stuff like this. Like my day job, I wouldn't get to the opportunity to, to design stuff like this. So is Flippy canonically related to Marcy? Hmm. Hmm. Maybe, maybe. Hmm. Hmm. They are both my children. Um, so yes. All right. So Baki V3. We need more stiffness. Uh, we should make the retention nub out of rubber. As you can see from like all the prototypes, they're just made out of more plastic. But um, in the eventual design of the flip grip, right, I would make it out of rubber. And the reason for that was was actually just having more options to be able to tune this, adjust this, and for it to have it be compliant. Um, and also it just kind of results in a better sliding feeling overall on the system. So that was another takeaway from that was another takeaway from Baki V3. So Baki V4, what was the goal for Baki V4? I noticed that with Baki V3, it was still not stiff enough. Like I was still feeling like it could be bent to a place where the switch would fall out. So uh, for Baki V4, I wanted to improve the stiffness of it. I wanted to test the thermals, right? Which is really important. Like how is this thing going to affect the switch's ability to breathe? Uh, so let's make it chunkier and how hot does it get? So we are moving in the opposite direction as Apple. Apple makes stuff, well, until very recently, Apple makes stuff thinner. They're singularly focused on making stuff thinner. Until very recently, yes, I know they started making their stuff thicker, but uh, I wanted to make it thicker to make it so that it felt more quality. Um, and so if you look at the various prototypes, you'll actually see when things, it's really hard to tell from this image here. I'll try and do it this way. This is a highly advanced mechanical engineering tool known as pair calipers. So this is, uh, this is, I think it was a V2. So this 
So you can see it's two millimeters thick, which means it's bendy. And then eventually, the actual flip grip, three millimeters thick. You might think to yourself, one millimeter? That doesn't make a big difference. I won't flash up the formula here, but there's actually a mechanical engineering formula that says that increasing the thickness of a member like that really makes it a lot stiffer, like by a lot. It's exponential. It's to the power of three. And so it goes like, woo. And so even getting, even just adding a little bit, it could have just even been half a millimeter and you would have noticed a big difference in the quality of the, of the product. I'm not going to get into that because that's like really intense mechanical engineering stuff. Um, but uh, that's, that was, that was really key. Like, especially now when you feel the flip grip, like you're not getting that bend out of that. Like it's just not happening um, because it's really stiff um, and it makes it feel like a higher quality product. How many months into the process are we? Uh, this is now 2018. So Flippy was made, oh yeah. So we were in Flippy here, hold up. Let's go back to the presentation. So Flippy was, this concept sketch was made on February 18th, 2018, according to my timestamps in my drawing program. And uh, yeah, so we're in, we're in February. Five millimeter V Tacoma arrows all over again. <laughs> Five millimeters of wood glue. <laughs> exactly. One millimeter of raw power. Cool. So, um, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I don't know. Adding stiffness really, uh, adding stiffness was just a matter of adding like a little bit of, a little bit, just one millimeter. And honestly, you wouldn't be able to, like, you wouldn't be able, if you hand two millimeter, three millimeter to people, they wouldn't be able to tell a difference in like the chunkiness of it, but they'll be like, this one feels higher quality. So it's like, it's, it's, it's maximal benefit and that's engineering. Um. <laughs> um, okay. So thermal testing, this is a, this is an example of using the scientific method. Here's our hypothesis. Here's our hypothesis. Does the flip grip cause an increase in the temperature of the console? Look at this sweating flippy. Very scared that Isaac Newton's going to overheat the, the switch. So, how did I test this? Now, this may be controversial. Some people may feel like this is, this is, this is one of the more controversial aspects of the flip grip's design. Um, so, to test this, I actually ran Breath of the Wild. And I went to what I felt was the most graphically intensive area in the game. It was, I forget which tower it was, but there's a tower where it's like, I mean, a lot of the towers are overlooking, but this one was intense. Like there was a lot going on from this tower. And if you jump off of it, it has to, you know, the draw distance increases and all this crazy stuff happens. And so what I was doing was I just went to that tower and I just kept uh, running around the tower by putting this little rubber band here, as you can see. Um, uh, and uh, I would measure the temperature after a great deal of time. The hottest game in more ways than one. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, the result was that there was literally no difference between the switch being on, uh, the switch having a flip grip and not having a flip grip in the temperature. And you might be like, how could that possibly be? It's covering the vents, right? That was one of the most controversial aspects, especially after we launched the Kickstarter. Everyone's like, this thing is this thing is suffocating the switch. This thing is suffocating the switch. Um, but uh, it it was uh, it wasn't. And the reason why is because it wasn't creating an airtight seal. Like this is one of the graphics that we used in the in the Kickstarter video. Like there's no there's no appreciable difference between these two temperatures, um, even after even after using like a super intensive game. Now, you might say, oh, Breath of the Wild is not the greatest example because it's very optimized for the system and all these sorts of things. Um, but the fact of the matter is most vertical mode games are not going to be graphically intensive. They're not going to be as graphically intensive as uh, Breath of the Wild, and so they're not going to run as hot. So it was, I think, a pretty good use case. Um, it actually makes the Switch cooler. Yeah, and this is, this is, this is not a real, uh, this is not a real, like, simulation or visualization as you would do in like a proper mechanical engineering setting but it was just an illustration to show you that 
look, there's air going in and out of all these areas for the switch. It's not, it's not going to overheat. And also it's, it's like, uh, we would watch, uh, we would watch these videos of these experiments. Where people are like wrapping the switch in a blanket. And even like that is not enough to, to get it to overheat. And, and even if it does overheat, Nintendo has safety stuff in place. So there's like multiple layers of redundancy. And the, the fact of the matter is the flip grip just doesn't make your switch hotter. It just doesn't. Uh, yeah, thanks. Well, yeah, I like that you came at this concern with science. Just, just, hey, you should be, just believe me. You got that little tempting. Yeah, exactly. I, I knew that for me, right? I mean, this is again, taking a step back, like around design in general, like this is a scary, this is a scary reality, right? Like this is a scary thought. The thought that this thing that I've spent months designing is maybe going to have this flaw that it overheats switches is a very scary reality. It's almost, it's almost so scary that it's like, oh, I don't even want to test it. Right. But that's absolutely the wrong attitude to have. You want to test these things. You want to take everything to the limit. You want to see if it breaks. You want to see when it breaks. So you got to run these things hard. I could have just run this with some, you know, punch out or some vertical mode game, but I was like, no, I want to run this like at max. Let's see what happens to really prove uh, this hypothesis. And so, I mean, that's kind of generally, like you saw me break that prototype earlier, even though the prototype's really old, doesn't really matter. But like breaking prototypes is really important because then you understand the limits of your design. Um, yeah. Seal it up for a combination flip grip slash burger grill. I wish Tetris effect was on a switch. Oh my goodness. That'd be amazing. Tetris effect with, with Tate mode. Oh, that would be, that would be amazing. Um, anyway, so this was a, this is a graphic that we made for the, for the, for the Kickstarter. This was from Everdread, who's just amazingly talented. So good. Um, so what do we learn from Boggy V4? Increasing the thickness of the back plate significantly improves sturdy feel and the safe the flip grip does not appreciably increase the steady state temperature of the console. So you can see Flippy is very relieved here. What's up, Ever Dread? So good, so good. Uh I'm gonna have a shout for you later. Um Okay. Baki V five. Now this was um this feature early on was something that I actually avoided. Um so it was like, oh man, it would be really useful to be able to use this thing as just like a general Tate mode stand. Um, but adding a kickstand, as we all know, has, has has its issues, right? Like people were always complaining about Nintendo's implementation of the of the kickstand and, and how many problems it caused. Um, and of course, this would add parts, which I did not want to do. I was really set now on this idea of making it just one piece, and so. Uh, you know, less parts, less cost, less complex, right? Um, for many reasons, I don't want to add this. I, I didn't want to add a kickstand like this. So we needed to come up with some other implementation. A good friend of mine, Kyle Tucker, who is uh, just a, he's a very important person to me. He's one of my best friends. And uh, he is my go-to guy whenever I have ideas. And, and he's got so many, so many great ideas. He's also a guitarist. He makes guitars. And he noticed on his guitar tuner, his Korg GA30 guitar tuner, that it has this big old slot in the back, which just costs nothing to include for them. Uh, it's literally just a credit card sized slot on the back so that you can take a guitar pick or a credit card and stick it in the back and then use that as a kickstand. And that allows them to make this whole chassis just out of, uh, 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 out of plastic, right? Yeah. So, uh, I was heavily inspired by this. Kyle pointed this out to me and I was like, that's genius. I want to do that. If only as a, just a joke, let's see if it works. We've already got these slots in the back of the switch on the flip grip. Like, can we use it? So here's a video that, uh, I made for fan gamer on March 28th, very close to April fool's day, mind you. <laughs> um, please don't steal my credit card information. I don't think you, I don't think you should be able to from this video because I taped over everything. So you can see this credit card just gets slotted in back there and then it works as a horizontal kickstand and it also works as a vertical kickstand. And I sort of posted this video to Fangamer as a joke, sort of like a haha, imagine, can you imagine? Because it's so close to April Fool's too. Um, but then I actually ended up implementing it because I like the, the idea so much. And I thought it was so clever. Like the idea of not adding any parts credit card, everybody has a credit card on them, you know, uh, 
they could just go into their wallet and pull out a credit card. But then, this is this is where the real cleverness comes out, okay? What if we have to include a set of instructions with the flip grip, right? You gotta include instructions. People gotta know how to put it on, take it off. It's very easy, but you gotta include instructions, right? What if the credit card wasn't just any old person's credit card, but that we included a plastic card as the instruction manual, like a deck of cards? But yeah, exactly. Flip grip rewards card. Yeah, so so we we now that's economical. Exactly, Colin Brain. Welcome, Colin Brain. Um, so you can see here we have this credit card logo on the back of this on the back of the flip grip. And so you can insert. There's actually a cavity at the bottom of this that holds the credit card. Um, this is some sketches. These these were actually the sketches that I was doing for instructions for the flip grip. This was before we realized that it was going to be. Or this is before I'd realized that I was going to do this, this instructional car design. Uh, you can see like, caring for a flip grip, I have all these different things. But yeah, these are all, uh, notice these are all in landscape mode. Caring for a flip grip, this is all the sketches that I was doing. Eventually I was like, wait, why am I doing these in landscape mode? Duh, I should do it in Tate mode. Looks way cooler that way. And so this is where uh, I started to use some of those other flippy designs. I think I made them for this instructional graphic. Um, <laughs> you know what that reminds me of? That reminds me of uh, when people would stick uh, credit cards inside of the, the, the Wii disk slot. Because that was like the first Nintendo system with like microtransactional elements. And so people would just be like, this is where I put in the credit card. And it just, and it, it'll just, it'll just eat it up. Anyway, Flip Group doesn't do that. Um, so this is, the Japanese one. I don't know if this was the final Japanese one that was used, but I just, it's just cool to see the Japanese version of it. So eventually we did turn it into a actual card that was included with the flip grip. This is, these are two cards It was double-sided. So you see two cards here and uh, boom, you can use it as your kickstand for the flip grip. Not speaking from experience, no, no Foco, I'm not. Um, and so if you've ever, <laughs> If you ever wanted to see what a lot of uh, uh, these cards come in, they come in a big old sleeve like this. It's actually quite heavy. I remember getting this shipment of like 16,000 cards or whatever. I got like 20,000 cards. It was very heavy because it's just a big old chunk of plastic uh, that's, that's sliced up a bunch of times. Thanks, y'all. Um, so, yeah, so that was... What did we learn from Boggy V5? Uh... Credit card kickstand, normal brain, is a clever way to implement a kickstand with no additional parts and relatively little complexity. Including a free plastic card as a kickstand is is slightly brighter brain, and then galaxy brain is including a plastic card as a kickstand and instructional manual. Thank you very much, thank you very much. So, all right, now, Baki V6. I kind of need to go to the bathroom. Maybe I'll go to the bathroom after Rocky Feet 6. Um, <laughs> I would love that, Poco. I would love that. Um, Bearded, you lost your flip grip instruction card? Hmm. 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 Okay. I'm noting that. I'm noting that. I want to be you, Holly. Okay. Anyway, let's let's continue. Let's continue. Baki V6. So this one is this is the this is the this is the final. This is the last prototype. I'm not judging you. I'm not judging you. I'm 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 thinking. I'm thinking, not judging. Thinking. We'll talk. We'll talk. Uh so Baki V6. This is the final this is the final design. We have to make one last one and this is going to be multi-purpose. So this is going to be used in campaign materials. It's going to be used to really take all the things that we've learned and put them into one last go, refine all the edges, maybe round off some corners here, add a little bit of space here, take a little space off there, really make it like super nice and tight. And then this is also the first one that I wasn't going to print with my printer. So I was going to print this with uh, an external print house that would make it, that would make it a lot nicer. So uh, this is Baki V6, which as you can see, it looks really nice looks a lot nicer than some of these other ones because it was made using a very expensive 3d printer 
<laughs> that I don't have. And uh, it was quite expensive to get this thing printed. Um, and so you can see it's credit card kickstand here. Here's a little demo video of it. I think this video was actually, this video might have been released to Kickstarter backers as part of an update. Yeah, you can see me insert it here. I really like this prototype. This is a really good one. Um, it feels really good. This wasn't uh, this wasn't made actually. This wasn't made through Fictive. This was made through a, a different company, Phenotype. Um, but uh, I also had a couple of these other ones made um, out of a different material. This is SLS nylon, which is basically a bunch of powder that gets lasered together and it makes the flip grip. Um, this one is not powder. This one it is a it's a big vat of of plastic that once you hit it with UV light, it gets, it hardens. And so you basically pull the flip grip out of this bath and you're shooting this flip grip shaped light at it as it's being pulled out of the bath and then eventually you have a flip grip. All right, so this is, uh, this is, this is like I said, this is the last prototype in the line before we started the next step, which was actually, you know, uh, building it. But uh, you can see kind of how far we've come through this Baki prototype, the, the proto stack. This is April 23rd. This is uh, one of the pictures that we took during the Kickstarter campaign. And that is the prototyping process for Baki. So what does that mean? We're basically, we're basically at the end of design. So oh, that's not the right graphic. We're basically at the end of design. Um, so the next step is to build. But before we can build, we need money because it takes a lot of money to build things. Remember this, this mold? This is a big piece of metal. It's thousands of dollars to make this, sometimes tens of thousands. Uh, in our case, tens of thousands, I don't remember. Um, but uh, you need money to do this. <laughs> a lot of money, money that I don't have. Because up until now, I've just been 3D printing everything on my own, and just like you know, yeah, it's just it's it's, it's been it's been relatively inexpensive. Um, which part of the pizza was designed? It was pepperoni. Why do I remember that? I remember that because I've because I know this slide deck like the back of my hand. That was a lie. Um, should just make the first mold out of plastic to save money, you know. That's actually not as crazy as, as you have an idea as you think it is, as, as you might mean it to be, John. Um, there's lots of different ways to make prototype molds. Um, in our case, the best way kind of to design the flip grip would require you to it, like basically go from 3D printing a lot of things and then go towards making just like a, a real deal tool because there's a lot of little complex things about the flip grip that I didn't get into in this talk. It does seem like it's just a piece of plastic but there's a lot going on with it and there's a lot of aspects that require it to, to, to be made out of like a real deal mold rather than like um, something that's kind of hacked together. What mold makes the mold? Well, see the mold, that's a great question, Bearded. That's a great question. The mold is not made from a mold. The mold is actually a big piece of metal that is cut. So a molding is like you take a bunch of plastic and you put it together and it becomes plastic, right? Molds are actually made using subtractive manufacturing, which means you start with a big piece of something and then you remove stuff from it. In this case, you remove the negative of your part and then it becomes it becomes your mold. Oh, I you know, I know. I just use it. I, I, know, I, know, I know what you meant, Beard. I, 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 I'm using it as an opportunity, a teachable moment. Okay, so we need a lot of money. How do you raise money? I don't know how to do that, but Fangamer does. Little old tool known as, boom, Kickstarter. It's Kickstarter time. It's the part of the process where we do a Kickstarter. Um, yeah, Sako, I'd love to, I, 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 I can, I, I've tried to keep it a little bit light on the complex stuff in this, in this talk, because I could talk forever about it, but why not injection mold the money? That's a great question. Then you get the feds knocking on your door. <laughs> Wait. I'm gonna reuse this graphic here. Booyah. Why can't we just 3D print everything? Right? Why can't we just print grips? Well, printing is not a mass manufacturing process, right? Like injection molding is a much cheaper and faster way to make lots of something. Printing is just not there yet. People are trying to get it there, but it's, it's just not there yet. Um, and so, yeah. 
Okay, so. So let's uh, let's actually talk through. Okay, what was I talking about? Oh yeah, Kickstarter time. Sorry, I'm starting to lose focus. Kickstarter time. Why do we raise Kickstarter? Why do we do Kickstarter? Two reasons, primarily. One is to raise the money that we need for tooling. Tooling is a fancy word for the big old pieces of metal that are going to make all the flip grips. The second thing is we need to assess demand, right? Who actually wants this thing? We have a sense that people will want it, but that's, again, that's just a hypothesis. Like, I think people want this. I think people need this. I think people want to play vertical games on the go, um, but we don't actually know. And until people put their money where their mouth is, so to speak, then we don't really, we can't really tell people want to buy it. So we launched a Kickstarter and there's lots of different aspects to running a Kickstarter. And this is really, I think, it, I, I love this part because this is really where I think Fangamer, um, you saw the beauty of, of the Fangamer team and like everyone banding together, all the different skill sets from all the different members of the team. It's really too many to list off, but this is just all the, some of the different aspects of it, right? There's a campaign video. There's shooting the photos of uh, and the videos of the flip grip, all the graphics, right? Worked really closely with Jazzy, who did an amazing job on this video. Uh, also took a bunch of photos. Um, Tony helped a ton on the graphics, and Everdred did a bunch of animations, and uh, I'm pretty sure Steve did some animations too. There's words, right? Like we had to write a bunch of stuff. Jeremy, me, and Dan, we all worked together to write all the text for the Kickstarter campaign. Um, the rewards, that, that part's not as complicated. <laughs> for some Kickstarter campaigns though, rewards are really complicated, right? But for us, we wanted to keep it simple because again, I'm just one dude. I, I can't do that much other than just make flip grips. Like that's my only goal. I'm not gonna make like, I don't know, flip grip uh, keychains or something like that. Uh, and so we only had two reward tiers. It was one flip grip, two flip grip a design philosophy of simplicity <laughs> through and through. Um, but there's all the promotion, there's all the social media stuff involved, right? Which was like a ton of work. Um, Erica did a bunch of stuff for social media. There's back of communication updates a lot. I, I actually did a ton of that as well. Um, and so it was all of us working together as a team to, to build this. And there's, there's so much more that I'm not listing and I apologize, but basically this was just like the fan gamer crew at like, it was, it was just amazing to watch. Um, Anyway, so there's a lot of aspects of running a Kickstarter campaign. Um, I'm not going to go into a ton of detail here, but uh, let's let's watch this video, huh? I actually don't know. I don't know if you'll be able to hear this video. You probably won't be able to hear this video, actually. What happens if I do this? This might be loud. Classic gaming on the Switch, even better, and that would be a portable vertical gameplay mode. Can That's you hear I'm the? Doing. Can you hear this? Up with my friends at Fan Gamer and engineer Mike Choi to create Flip Grip, a simple Switch grip that allows you to play classic games in vertical mode. We wanted to create a simple, easy Look at this way loser. for people to play vertical-oriented games without wasting a single pixel of the Switch's screen. <laughs> it had to be just as convenient as playing the Switch by itself. I could probably After do this video from memory. We arrived at this solution. We designed the flip grip to allow for one orientation of the console, exposing the card slot and the headphone jack. You've probably noticed that it covers a few of the air vents, but here's, here's why that's why not, not a problem. problem. The flip grip does not create an airtight seal around your console, so <laughs> air is still flowing into every vent, even the ones that seem covered. We've run tests with and without the grip installed, and there's no appreciable difference in temperature, even with intensive games like Breath of the Wild. <laughs> we designed the flip grip to only operate in battery mode. You cannot charge or dock your switch while the flip grip is installed. So that means your console will never run at full power, which keeps the heat and airflow nice and manageable. It's stronger and more affordable than anything you could 3D print on your own. Plus, it's durable enough to withstand the anger you may feel while playing a vertical shooter. A lot of old arcade games flipped their giant zero, Danny. That's the magic. That's the magic of, of this, Everdread and Steve Campos and Jazzy. Zero grips were destroyed in that we video. Flip grip to be just for classic games. We hope developers, whether they're porting old classics or new indie titles, like the flip grip as well. And we hope that you like it too. The hard part for us, engineering, testing, and prototyping, it's already done. All that's left now is to raise the funds we need to put the flip grip into production. And that's where you come in. Thanks for watching. <laughs> 
<laughs> if only it were that easy, Jeremy. If only it were that easy. We're done with everything. We just need to raise money to do it. You'll see very soon that that is not the case. Um, but yeah, the video is super, super duper professional. And that was all jazzy and uh, Everdread. And oh my goodness, they're amazing. They're amazing. I mean, look at that. Look at that thing at the beginning. I just told Everdread like, hey, I kind of wanted to do this and then this and then and then you just like, boom, made it. So we launched it on June 21st, 2018. And then in, wait, wait, what do you mean? What? Are, wait, so I lied what? <laughs> wait, what did I lie about? Please tell me. Anyway, so we launched it oh, about being ready to go. Oh, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so uh, we launched it on June 21st, 2018. And uh, it was, I think it was 13 hours, 13 hours. And then we hit the $42,500 goal. It funded in less than 24 hours. Uh, here's a image that I posted once. Uh... <laughs> Look, if you know where this image is from, then you know. Um, so that was a noise. Oh. Yeah, exactly. This is May Nice Choi. Oh my goodness. What a throwback. So uh, we raised uh, the funds very, very quickly. And then it kept going from there. Um, <laughs> it kept going from there. Here's a little graphic. It launched on June 21st. It fully funded in less than 24 hours. And at the end of the 18 day funding window, there was 8,270 backers raised $140,000 and $140,986, 332% of our goal. Um, and so, I mean, that was overwhelming. Like, obviously, would have it was, it was not possible without the efforts of everybody, right? I mean, Jeremy also, like, doing a bunch of promotion for it and the amazing Kickstarter video and all the coordination, all this stuff. And so it was just, like, it was everyone's powers combined to to create this this incredible moment that we were just all so happy about um and so i remember drawing during this time <laughs> we were doing a lot of updates so i drew a bunch of these scenarios of of the flippy astronaut um you know going to space here's one and then going to hyperspeed Woo! anyway so Successful Kickstarter campaign. What? Also, oh yeah, obviously it wouldn't have been possible without all the people supporting it, right? Like I know Bearded and Sako and all these people like actually helped fund it. So that was really amazing. Um, anyway, so now what? Now that Flippy has launched and we have raised the money. What's up, Mina? Uh, now, this is where, uh, this is, and now we have all this money that we can, we're, we're ready to go and actually purchase the tools and do other things like, this is where uh, this part of the process, oh geez, where is it? Here it is. That's where this part of the process, the build begins, okay? And this is when, this is the part where things are no longer within my control. Up until this point, as you can imagine, I've had a ton of control over pretty much the entire process, all aspects of the design, all aspects of fabrication, uh, any uh, g gathering feedback, um, even even stuff like the design, like Flippy, um, the Kickstarter campaign, like all this stuff I had input on, I had control over. This is where stuff starts to become out of my control because no matter how amazing I am or whatever, I can't make tens of thousands of flip grips from my house. I have to outsource it to a vendor who will do it. And I'll try and be involved as I can in that process, but I still don't have full control over it. So, um, so what does that mean? So uh, Flippy had to go to China. There's a little graphic that I used during one of the production updates. Flippy going to China. I drew this little toot toot uh, airplane. Going to Dongguan, which is where we were making it. Um, here is a little 
view, I've, I've redacted a lot of this information for confidentiality purposes, but I had to make a 10 page production document for Flipgrip. And this is a highly detailed document detailing like every 10th, hundredth of a millimeter that's important, all these different aspects of the design, the texture, the cosmetics, um, uh, the type of material that it's made out of, uh, all these different important details when it comes to actually making something, right? And this is, this is, this is not 3D printing anymore. This isn't just hit print and it prints out of a printer. This is like, this thing is going to be made through a advanced, you're not advanced, but like a, you know, a industrial process now that has lots of variables and all those variables need to be controlled in a, in a very specific way um, for it to work, for it to function. And so you can see I have some, uh, there's functional aspects to this, this top left one you can see here. Um, it's got, uh, it's got like all the, I, I've, I've redacted them all, but it's like all the dimensions, like this Joy-Con rail needs to be, you know, 8.15 millimeters wide for it to fit all these different things. So it's, it's very, very much, these two things are symmetric. These things aren't symmetric. Uh, it's really important to go through and, and specify all these things when you're doing a mechanical drawing. And then on the top right, you can see some stuff like cosmetics. So like I'm saying, Hey, the flip grip, um, like for instance, maybe this is something that you didn't really notice, but. Like when you look at the flip grip, right? You see how flippy is shiny, but the rest of it is not shiny. This is all stuff that needs to be detailed in a engineering document, like a production document. And so that was really important. Um, and that's what that's what this top right document talks about. Um, yeah, and so making this like production drawing, really, really important. Then I take this drawing and I talk to vendors. I used a vendor that um, I'm, I'm good friends with the people running the running running the machines and everything like that and um and doing all the stuff and uh it was a vendor that i'd worked with before and that i trusted um or that i trust still it is a lot of work it is an enormous amount of work <laughs> and then i go to china here's a video of me in china this is me finding a mcdonald's in china uh this is at my bus stop uh and then here is me at the actual factory so now this is the part of the process where Again, like I said, I don't have control over this. Someone else is now making the grips. I'm not making the grips anymore. Someone else is, but I'm trying to be involved at every step in the process to make sure it's going smoothly and to make sure that all the right things are being taken into account. Um, this is August 9th, 2018. This is a very, very hot summer in China. Uh, very, very humid. Uh, you can't really see me sweating in this video, I don't think. Um, but so this is me uh, starting production. So this is like I'm going to China to start the production of tens of thousands of these flip grips. All right, here I am at the factory where we're doing the molds and the uh, mold. Whoops, let's try that again. All right, here I am at the factory where we're doing the molds and the uh, mold test for the flip grip. This is called Bliss. In Chinese, it's Kang uh, Vault. That's what I was told. Uh, but anyway, we're gonna go inside and see what's going on. So this is me going into the factory where they're expecting me, so they have all this stuff laid out. Here, actually, I'm gonna turn off the volume for this one and just explain it. So this is me walking into um, the, uh, thanks Josiah. Was I nervous? Let me talk about that in a little bit. I'll talk about how nervous I was. So these are the actual big old chunks of steel. Look at that. Let me tell you why this is ner extraordinarily nerve wracking. These are giant pieces of metal that we worked super hard to raise tens and tens of thousands of dollars to purchase these pieces of metal that are based off of a thing that I designed in my room. For me, I've done this before. I, I, sh I should clarify this whole process. I've done it a bunch, actually, in much more complex situations for work, because this is what I do for my job. But there's something different when it's your personal project. When it's like a when it's your baby, it's my actual product. It's my actual design. Uh, and that's not to say that my work isn't my actual design. But there's a little bit more of this feeling of security when you know that you're working for a company, you know, but like for me, this is really the buck stops with me. Whether or not this is good or like works, it really is my full responsibility and I have to own up to whether or not it works or not. Very terrifying, 
big old pieces of metal that are just designed out of, uh, that are just the negative of something that I designed. Very, very nerve wracking. Um, did I get to keep those steel plates? Um, those steel plates, I don't get to keep them because, well, I mean, I do own them or we own them. I don't know. I own them. I think I own them. Uh, but, uh, the, uh, the, they're, they're in China. I don't have any use for them here. Cause if we ever make more flip grips than they need to be in China is extraordinarily, um, exactly, exactly bearded, bearded squid. Um, you know, we're, we're trying to now the expectations are set, right? We set the expectations with the Kickstarter. Oh, wait, I was like, why is it so quiet? It's because we don't have music. Here we go. Um, they were a negative, but they turned into such a positive. That's right, John. Thanks. Um, but yeah, as you can imagine, this is very nerve wracking um, because, you know, the expectations were set with Kickstarter uh, backers and like people had expectations for where it was at. And for me, you know, even though this is honestly, honestly, I don't mean this is like a flex or anything like that. This is relatively simple compared to what I do for my actual job because it's there's it's just a piece of plastic. But something about it you know many many late nights getting to this point like staying up till three four five in the morning talking to vendors in china working on this design and you know really fine-tuning it and then finally getting to the place this is actually a very extraordinarily emotional moment <laughs> seeing these big old pieces of metal with little flippies engraved into them um and so yeah anyway so here's a picture this is like really emotional music now um but uh this is a picture of the actual molds so you can see them here um so you can see that there's four pieces why are there four pieces when i said there's only two pieces earlier um well that's because if you look at the flip grip right there's actually here i'll just use this overhead camera um there's two parts to it right there's this orange part and this black part those need to be molded separately there's two separate molds for that it's it's you might say that oh that's a double shot that's technically not a double shot it's actually just an over mold um i'll get into that i'll get into the details of that later um you might know double shot if you're a keyboard mechanical keyboard enthusiast you might know that from there but um yeah anyway so yeah, exactly this is the this is the this is the sonogram this is the sonogram of flippy and you can see flip grip in there and, and all the parts um another thing about this factory for whatever reason this is just a fun side detail but i found it quite uh, i found it quite uh exciting and disturbing at the same time they had this scary horse in their office and uh it looks like the horse from breath of the wild uh but uh yeah anyway that was pretty scary so um that was that's that's just a little look into my time in china um why would I show this? I don't know why. I don't know why it has ears. That's a good question. Are there ear bones? Um, what is double shot? I'll explain that in just a little bit. I actually really need to go use the restroom. So I will go and use the restroom and be right back. Oop. Give me a second.
All right. I'm back. Okay. Oh man, that feels so good. Can I just say, I feel like I have a second win now to go through this very long presentation. So we're in China. We have big pieces of metal. Now we use those big pieces of metal to make plastic and then we have to figure out what's wrong with it. This process of going overseas and overseeing the tooling and really seeing what the actual, now I'm actually, I'm not looking at 3D prints anymore. I'm looking at the final parts that are actually going to get delivered to Kickstarter backers, right? Or like precursors to that. This is where stuff, this is where it's going to go wrong. This is where it's going to start to go wrong. And uh, uh, there's a lot of stuff that happened during this time. I'm just going to go into a few examples of unexpected things that happened. This is where the unexpected happens. The great unknown, let's say. Okay. So issue number one is something I'm going to call the magic dimension. This isn't so much as an issue as it is something that is really important to think about. Okay. The magical dimension. What the heck am I talking about? Let's talk about the magical dimension. So when you look at your switch, right? Uh, and you feel that Joy-Con and you feel it click into place, right? It feels really good. Um, Beard, I will explain double shot later. I will explain that later. Um, but like you take a Joy-Con, you put it in a switch. Feels good, right? You hear that click. Oof. But if you've... Uh, ever taken your friend's Joy-Con or your friend's Switch and you've inserted maybe your Joy-Con into their Switch or you've tried their Switch, you might notice that it feels a little bit different depending on which Joy-Con you use. Now, I'm going to tell you why that happens and it's all explained with this concept that I call the magical dimension, okay? When you look at a Joy-Con, I don't know if you ever looked at how a Joy-Con actually registers into place, but there's this little button right on the back. And that depresses this little gray triangle inside the rail. And then that little gray triangle registers on the rail of the switch. I'll show you right here. So like, it's kind of hard to see, but there's like a little gray bit right there. And then there's this like slot on here. You kind of see it move. It registers inside of there. Um, here, here's a here's a good graphic kind of showing you what happens. This is with the flip grip, but it's it's the same it's the same deal. So like, see it go around, turn around, depresses, clicks into place, right? So that's all governed by this thing that I'm calling the magical dimension. Okay. It's the dimension from the top of that little triangle to the bottom of the rail. Those are the two locations that the Switch Joy-Con is locating off of. In other words, the bottom needs to touch for the actual communication to work, right? Because the actual Joy-Con like touches there. There's a little bit of, there's electricity that passes through that portion of the Joy-Con. And then the top of that triangle needs to touch the rail because that's how it gets held into place. It like clicks into place. Some of you may have noticed that over time, that triangle can wear down and then you can just remove the Joy-Con from your Switch. I actually have a Joy-Con like that. Let me show you. So here's an example of a Joy-Con where that triangle has worn down. You'll see, I'll put it in and you'll hear a click, but it's kind of a dull click. And then if I want to, I can just pull it off. I don't even need to press that button on the back. It just comes off. This is actually a very common problem with Joy-Cons. Um, and I've seen it happen very, very often. It can cause major issues when you're playing games, as you can imagine. Um, it, is, it is a bit terrifying. That part is replaceable. There's something incredibly disturbing about that. Yes, it's, it's, it is because there's this plastic piece that's riding against this metal piece. The switch rail is metal. This is plastic. Eventually one of them will win the, the metal's going to win, right? And so Nintendo did this intentionally. They did this so that the Joy-Con would, um, it, it's the replaceable part, right? You can replace this. Replacing this is a lot more expensive. 
And so I believe that they made this rail for durability purposes and, um, you know, other reasons as well, but like durability purposes. And then they made it so that this is plastic so that it'll, it'll, it'll wear over time. Cause if they had it both be metal, then it might cause some grinding, some dust to happen. One interesting side note is you can go on eBay and buy metal versions of that triangle to install into your switch. I have not tried that before. Personally speaking, that scares me. The idea of riding the metal triangle against the metal rail, I don't think that's what Nintendo intended. Uh, that's kind of a weird phrase. Um, I don't think that's what they intended because I, I think I, I believe that with enough abrasion, that would actually cause dust, which is metal dust, which is very not good for your Switch. Anyway, whoop, sorry. All this to say, this is the magical dimension. Okay, I'm gonna call this the magical dimension from now on. This distance is very, very important, right? For me, I am making a accessory that is essentially trying to emulate, for lack of a better word, the experience of inserting uh, the Switch into, uh, uh, or the Joy-Con into a Switch, right? I'm going for that. Right? That was a flip grip. That was a switch, right? I'm going for I'm going for the switch level of feel. So whatever that magical dimension is, I need to nail that. I need to figure out what that magical dimension is. But it's not that simple. It's not as, it's not just as simple as figuring out and to even say, hey, okay, Mike, just take a just take a Joy-Con and measure it, right? Just take it and take your fancy little tool and come in here and say, okay, yeah, it's about this much, right? It's not that simple. And I'll tell you why. It gets this is where it gets very complicated. Because the switch, unlike the flip grip, is not just made out of one part, right? It's actually made out of many parts. Right? You take apart a part of you take apart a switch. It's got tons of parts in it. Just the Joy-Con in and of itself, right? The Joy-Cons are so expensive. They have so many parts inside of them. There's a lot going on. Forget forget about the electrical. Forget about all the stuff. Forget about all the guts. Just think about the mechanical. Just the just this just this little plunger and the little triangle and the rail and the and the housing. All those things are working together, and they all vary. They all have variations. So like, imagine I've took a sample of six Joy-Cons, right? that magical dimension in an ideal world would be the same in all six, but it's not, it varies. That's the scary thing. And that's why if you take your Joy-Con and you put it in your friend's Joy-Con, it might feel different. Or you take your friend's Joy-Con and you put it in your Switch, it'll feel different than when you put your own Joy-Con in your Switch. That's why some accessories feel a little bit different. This concept is a very important part of manufacturing it's called tolerances. And it basically is a fancy word for saying there's variation. There's variation. All these little variations add up. All these parts adding together are going to make it so that there's actually a distribution of, uh, of that magical dimension. It's not always one dimension. It's magical dimension plus half a millimeter, magical dimension minus maybe half a millimeter. As you can imagine, as someone who is designing a product that hinges on being used in, uh, with an existing product, the notion of that variability is absolutely terrifying, right? I have to, um, uh oh, just discovered my right Joy-Con can slide right out of my flip grip. That's sorry, I'm sorry to hear that. Sorry. See, it's a, it's a major issue. Um, I need to design the flip grip in such a way that it is compatible with all Joy-Cons. How is that possible? Well, I need to identify, I need to identify the uh, worst case scenario, let's say, and I need to design for that. I need to design for the scenario where all Joy-Cons will fit and maybe some of them will be a little bit loose, but all of them will fit versus making it, so I design it for the middle case scenario so that some of them work and most of them work and they feel good, but then there's a bunch that don't work. That is the situation that we need to avoid. To make this matter even more complicated, the magical dimension varies between flip grips. If I take this flip grip and this flip grip and I measure that distance for the two, it's gonna be darn close. But depending on the temperature of the day when it was manufactured, depending on uh, how things were warping or how it was stored, all these different things, that causes that magical dimension on the flip grip to change too. 
So all these things, they're, they're, they're living and breathing, they're changing. This is, I would say, probably the most challenging aspect of this design. And it is why the flip grip is, is, is more than meets the eye in terms of how, in terms of the design of it. Because you think, oh, it's just a piece of plastic, right? How hard could it be? But designing for Joy-Cons that vary is actually enormously challenging. Think about how many switches have been sold, right? It's millions, millions of switches have been sold, right? Think about every Joy-Con, every switch comes with two Joy-Cons. Then you have all the additional Joy-Cons. So you have probably millions and millions and millions more Joy-Cons out there in the wild. How could I possibly account for all of them? How could I possibly account for them? Well, the real answer to that is that I just need to get a really good sample size of Joy-Cons. So I actually would go around and I would go to my friends and, and we would hang out and I'd be like, hey, can I try your Joy-Con? They'd be like, sure. And I'd take the Joy-Con out and be like, hell yeah. And I would like measure it, you know? And I would be like, every time I would find a Joy-Con that was tighter or weird dimension wise or a little bit on the fringe or, or an outlier, I would be like, hey, can I buy this from you? Or can I trade? I'll buy you a new Joy-Con. Just let me have this one. I need this one. And so I actually amassed a collection of not just my own personal Joy-Cons, which I had like, you know, I don't know, four or something like that. I, now I have a lot more um, from this development. But then I would also borrow my friend's controllers that were kind of on the fringe. And eventually I had like 20 Joy-Cons that was sort of my sample size for, for, um, for, you know, kind of a distribution from that distribution. I don't have any graphics for this part, but from that distribution, I could sort of infer, you know, using, you know, a little bit of mechanical engineering sense, like what that, what that variation will be. And then account for that in the switch or in the flip grip. Not only that, but remember what I said earlier about designing so that you can adjust later on. That's another key part of addressing this issue, so to speak, is that eventually this, this will need to be tuned. The difference between a flip grip feeling like that versus a flip grip feeling like this, you might, have, you might not have heard a difference, but like there is a difference in that feeling. It is as simple as a difference in a couple degrees, maybe not even a couple degrees, uh, when they're running the big machine that shoots the plastic, like changing those temperatures, all these sorts of things, right? It's really important. You can't even also with the flip grip. Another thing about it is that it's not just a number, right? It's not just like, oh, if it is this number, it will fit, right? Because of all these variations, it's a lot about feel. It's a lot about it. Does it feel right when it goes in? Is it really frictiony? Is it like, is it, does it have that positive click that is so it's literally the it's the brand identity of the switch is that is this is the switch clicking right or is the joy-con clicking in a place so one aspect of this of addressing this is uh a flexible design as i was saying whoops ignore this a flexible design that allows for tuning it's a design that accounts for all the variations in flip grips based on my research and then the, th the third prong of the solution is when you're on the factory floor and you're making these, how do you know that they work? You're not gonna take on a factory, uh, you're on a factory floor, you're not gonna take, uh, after every grip is installed, you're not gonna take one and, and then measure it very carefully, right? The measurement of this little thing will be different every time someone's on the factory floor trying to do this, right? The clearest way to communicate that is with a Joy-Con, is with to give them a Joy-Con and say, does it feel like this? That's called a fit gauge, or at least that's what I call a fit gauge. Here's a video of the fit gauge that I made. So I made this as a tool to communicate with the factory, with the vendors, to show them, hey, this, this feel is really important. I'm gonna change the music. This feel is really important. The way that this clicks is really important. So this is actually an instructional video that I made, and um, there's a one of the pages in that production document uh, is um, one of the pages in the production document is an instruction on how to use this, right? So there's there's lots of different approaches to how you account for this sort of variability in um, in manufacturing. This is the way that I did it, right? There's some very sophisticated ways that you can do it using like you know statistics and all this stuff like that. 
for me, I took a little bit more of a, of a, a, a I don't know, a hacky approach, but it, it mostly worked. Did you contact Nintendo to get tolerances? Maybe they have info about it, but it's confidential. Nintendo wouldn't give out that information. <laughs> There's, I, I never, we never tried, um, but I don't imagine, I don't imagine actually they would give out that information. Um, and yeah, I mean, it makes sense. So yeah, anyway, this part's really complex. It's the magical dimension. And what does this, what does this mean? Like basically it's, it's a big part of it is just sitting down and this is me, this is me in China. You can tell from that Chinese Coke. This is me just sitting down with all of my Joy-Cons and this isn't all of them, but like going through and being like, hey, this is this is how this feels and going through the different variations. So we get, we, we make like, you know, 20 or 30 of them and then we measure the variability of all the different flip grips and we measure them against the different Joy-Cons and really just kind of like go through this process of checking them. Uh, and, and essentially, I mean, it's essentially it's quality control, but it's also in this situation, it's before we make 16,000, let's make sure that we can make them consistently and, and functionally. All right. Does that make sense? <laughs> I am a product design engineer. Uh, Calvert, which is which is why I'm talking about some of this stuff, um, and I'm not going into a ton of detail because I don't want to confuse people. Um, anyway, that's the magical dimension. Issue number one. Now, my second example. This is a very scary one. Bum bum bum. Disintegrating flip grips. This one was. I'll tell you. This one was absolutely terrifying. Uh, I want to answer Mark. Were you fully aware of all this before you got to the build stage? Or were you a little surprised of how big a deal it was? I was aware of this. I was aware of all this Joy-Con variability um, before the build stage, in the design stage. And that's what I don't really go into detail about in this, is like, as I'm going through the different Bakis, um, let's see here. This document is actually, didn't start on May 26th. It wasn't like, oh, I got the Kickstarter. Like this actually was in process well before then because I was trying to take into account all these things. And so, you know, for me, I'm really fortunate. Like I said, this is my job. And so I know to look out for these sorts of things because it's not my first rodeo. But if it was my first rodeo, it would be a different story. I would be, I would be quite surprised. Um, but I'm, 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 I'm kind of pumping it up for the theater. This has all been easy to follow. Thank you. Oh, that's awesome, Carrie. Thank you so much. Um, so issue number two, disseminating flippers. Now, John, here's an example of a problem that I did not foresee. Okay. This is a real issue, a real issue and a problem that I did not foresee. The flip grip has this little rubber part on it, right? Feels good, right? Switch slides against it. I took these prototypes, these first prototypes that I got off of the factory. I was like, okay, dimensions look good. Joy-Cons click, put in the switch, take it out. And what did I, what did I notice? Boom. I don't know if you see that in the picture on the right here. The left is what it's supposed to look like. The right is what it actually ends up looking like. You see these little bits, these little eraser bits? It looks like, it looks like I just tried to erase the inside of the switch, right? Or inside of the flipper. I keep saying that. The rubber was disintegrating like an eraser. When you would insert the switch, it would erase or it would like, it would fall apart. I tested this. Let me show you how I tested this. So I, I, I specially selected the, the black and the orange plastic for this flip grip. Like I picked a very specific material, not like just the chemical, but like the actual brand of the material. This is a sample from the vendor of the material. So I made sure that under the pressure that the switch would be exerting against the flip grip, that it would not do this, right? You can imagine you push on it hard enough and you rub fast enough, it will cause it will cause that to happen, but I want to know under normal cases that that would never be close to happening. 
I did that by testing samples of rubber from this vendor uh, under the right loading circumstances. And it wasn't happening. So I was like, cool, let's proceed, let's go. Go to China, this starts happening. I'm freaking out, I'm freaking out, okay? I'm like, can I see a, um, can I see the, uh, the certification documents for the material? Can I see, uh, can I see the material, like the bag of the material? Can I make sure that it's the right material? All these different things I'm trying to figure out what's going on. They say, yeah, it's the right material, it's the right color, it's all these sorts of things. Like, we don't know why it's happening, we don't know why it's happening. And uh, I was absolutely tormented because uh, this was this was a deal breaker. This this is this is catastrophic, right? Um, yes, it is. It does keep it, the rubber is to keep the switch from sliding out. Um, this is a catastrophic failure. Um, very very scary. And I was sitting in my hotel room, racking my brains. What's going on? What is happening? I couldn't figure it out. I called my good friend, Mark Gallagher who's an engineer and mechanical engineer and, and just a one of the smartest people I know. And I'm telling him about this thing and I'm like, yeah, and you know what? To make matters worse, it's freaking it's so hot outside. It's so humid. It feels like when I walk outside, I'm walking into a, I'm like just stepping into a sauna. And he says, wait, you said it's humid? And I was like, yeah, it's Dongguan in August. You know, it's really, really hot and humid. And he pointed out, he said, get the process uh, documentation for this rubber. Because what was happening, when you're molding this material, okay, I'm gonna take a step back. When you're molding this material, right, you need it to, you need these plastic molecules to bond to each other and to bond, bond to each other and bond to the black, but really it's bond to each other. With the humidity, um, with the humidity in the air, water molecules were actually coming in and preventing those molecule, those plastic molecules from properly adhering to each other because of how humid it was in China. This is a very common occurrence actually. And so in many materials for plastics and rubbers, it's important that you bake the material before putting it into the machine. So you actually put it in an oven and you bake it like this. And uh, it, yeah, oh, well, I should use this graphic. Yeah, basically this is like, for instance, this material on the left, right? Which is not the exact material that we use, but it's something similar, right? It was being, uh, it was being prohibited from bonding to itself due to the water molecules inhibiting the <laughs> bonding of the plastic molecules. Now, I don't know about you, I don't think at this scale, I'm a mechanical engineer, I think about things that I can see. I don't think about electrons either, because they're invisible and they can kill you. I should probably think about them more. That's an exaggeration, um, but I'm not thinking at this scale, right? So this was completely out of left field for me, but luckily, thanks to the guidance of my good friend, Mark Gallagher, he pointed me towards a solution and it was, Wait, it was it. That was the problem. It Once we started baking the material, this is an exaggeration, this is not the kind of oven that they would use, but once you start baking the material, there's very specific instructions. You bake it for you know this temperature, this amount of time, and you only have 15 minutes to use it, and then you have to bake it again. I went to the factory and I talked to the people and I said, hey, are you following these instructions? And they said, no. <laughs> and I was like, oh, okay. It's, I think it's fair I think it's fair for them to not uh, be following that and see I'm getting hot just talking about it um, it's it's you know it's I'm not blaming them or anything like that like it makes sense like if they didn't expect that you know that was a thing that they had to do um, they wouldn't have checked it because they just probably thought it was just like any other you know they're like oh we don't they, you know we're put we're pushing them on time we're saying hey we need this done really quickly we need this done really quickly so they, they sometimes they don't take into account all these things and especially in our application it makes sense that they wouldn't have tried to do that because once they make it they look at it they say hey, like, it works. They're not, you know, trying to actively abrade the abrade the, the rubber part of the switch. Anyway, so that was issue number two. Disintegrating flip grips. Once we started baking the material, it fixed it.
So what's the what's the lesson here learned? It's 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 the lesson is quite uh, is quite um, specific, but it's uh, it's make sure that you're don't don't assume that your vendors are going to follow your process documentation, <laughs> which could be you know abstract to lots of things, right? Like. You have to make sure you check every part of the process, right? For me, I was there and I was really trying to make sure that I was following every bit of the process and making sure that it was all like done correctly. Um, but this was something that fell under my radar. There's so many things. There's so many things that I had to keep track of. Um, oh, snap. Okay, I'm getting a time limit warning. Um, okay, let's try and blast through the rest of this. So issue number three. Issue number three is... Uh, was another very unexpected issue um, and something that was, you know, we, 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 while we were writing the Kickstarter updates and everything, we said, hey, you know, uh, uh, we're going to get this out by this date, barring an act of God. That's what we would say. And uh, lo and behold, uh, around this time uh, is when uh, that part of Asia was aff uh, afflicted with Typhoon Mankut which if you remember was actually pretty, pretty uh, bad typhoon. Um, and it shut down uh, a lot of that area for a good amount of time. Uh, this was the path of the typhoon. And uh, you can kind of see this as a comparison against this map of, of China. So you can see it kind of goes through this area here. And uh, that that's kind of right in the path of where we were manufacturing flip grips. Um, so weather is a is a theme here but obviously like this was something that we couldn't could possibly control um and for me i mean this is kind of speaking personally this was a good reminder that you can't control everything like there's so many variables to this process there's so many variables that can happen when you're making a product. There's, there's so many things that you can't control. And this really put things into perspective for me because at the end of the day, like these vendors, like I'm getting lunch with these people. I'm getting dinner with these people. These are my friends, um, the people who are working at the factory, all these sorts of things. And so um, it's really uh, put me in, in perspective for me, like, hey, I just, all I care about, look, I care about these people being safe, that they stay indoors, that they stay in shelter, that they don't yet uh you know that they don't go to work and risk their lives just just to make these flip grips for this kickstarter right um and so you know we provided that in the form of an update to the backers saying like hey this is our priority right now our priority is that like we shut things down and everything stays safe right and you know and and luckily all the all the backers were very understanding about that um but yeah, I mean, as you can imagine, this is just a, this is a great example of something that's completely outside of your control, and it really just put things puts things in a perspective. And and for me, you know, um, you know, even if even if I didn't, even if I never went to China and I never met these people, I don't know these people, right? Like, nothing is nothing is worth, you know, human lives being lost for this reason. Um, you know, it's just a little video game accessory. But for me personally, it was like really good perspective to have because, as you can imagine, like this is my entire world for the for the span of like you know, uh, over oh, almost a year now um, at this stage in the process. And so um, it really put things in perspective for me. Anyway, okay. So uh, once Typhoon subsided and we were able to get these grips out, these were the production samples. So these are the first injection molded flip grips. These are no longer, they're no longer, um, they're no longer 3D printed, right? This is a, this is a real, this is a real actual manufactured flip grip. You can see that here, and this is like approved. Hey, we're good to go. This fits. Everything works. All my Joy Cons worked with it. It feels good. Nothing's disintegrating. Let's proceed. Let's make thousands of these. Just super sweet. So they start making them, and then in the meantime, now I have to take care of the logistics of, on on our end of you know how are we going to receive these? How are we going to package them? How are we going to ship them to customers? This is a really unique part of the story because I think this is generally speaking where my normal day job would end. Um, I wouldn't really do much beyond this part, but um, Flipgrip was a really unique experience for me because I was really involved with the entire process from the napkin sketches all the way up to the packaging, which is what I'm gonna talk about next. <laughs> So um, for flip grip packaging, it's pretty simple. You know, uh, we're not really doing anything too complicated. 
Here's a video, or here's a picture of one of the Flipgrid prototype packages that I made. Um, so this is the design that I uh, made for, all, you know, uh, made out of using the, the drawings from the Flipgrid. I adjusted it and tweaked it and, and stuff like that. But um, here's a video of me actually uh, laser etching it as a prototype. Um, you know, although the packaging is really simple for Flipgrip, there's a lot of thought that gets put into how it's actually packaged to make sure that it arrives safely. I love these time-lapse videos. <laughs> um, one... Whoop. Hold up. Oh, loud. Here's a, here's a unboxing video. I actually have a laser. I actually have a laser cutter, um, Heidi, uh, at home. <laughs> uh, so as you can see here, this is uh, this is the flip grip. This is prototype packaging. So this looks different from the packaging that you actually get, which I'll show you in a little bit. But I laser etched. I was like, "Hey, what's up, Jam?" Um, and so you can kind of see that there is like an air gap through the sides and that's to protect the packaging uh, or that's to protect the flip grip so that if you drop it there's like an air gap that's built into the box um, and as you can see it came with a sticker and that instructional card that we were talking about laser cutting time last videos with jazz bgm yeah that'd be pretty awesome um, so you can kind of see a little bit more of it here, but it's kind of hard to tell, but there's like a big air gap in the corners. And so that's if you drop the flip grip packaging, it stays, it keeps safe. It keeps safe. It stays safe as it's on its way to the, to the end customer. Um, yeah, sure, I can, I can explain a little bit more about the gap. So, so like, you see that gap, right? That means that when you drop the packaging on its corner, uh, which is typically like the most vulnerable area, right? It will actually hit cardboard and not the actual flip grip itself. Like here. See this? This is the packaging. So like this corner protects the actual contents of the packaging in theory, you know, when, when it gets thrown around. So exactly. It's like a bumper. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's a bumper. <laughs> um, and then actually packaging them. So we receive all the parts. I won't get started on receiving tens of thousands of something. That's, that's a whole other logistical nightmare, but, um, receiving tens of thousands of something from China and then going through and packaging them. So this is now not, this is no longer overseas. This is now in, in Arizona. Um, and as you can see here, look at all these packages, look at all these flip grip packaging. And oh yeah, by the way, so that's the final packaging. Um, and yeah, I included some fun details. Like, um, if you watch this video for long enough, the little tab says, in, it has Flippy on it and says, enjoy. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so um, I don't know if you've ever seen tens of thousands of something that you designed, but it's quite, uh, it's quite overwhelming, actually. <laughs> Um, it's actually, uh, it, it's, it gives you a sense of scale, like, oh my goodness, this thing fills up a room, like this many of something. Um, and, uh, yeah, so here's a couple shots of the actual process. Here's, um, this isn't at Fangamer, this is actually at a different warehouse, but you can see all the flip grips being packaged. Um, and here's all the contents. So we have these little bag, these little plastic baggies which I had to like specify a very specific plastic baggie with like the correct dimensions and everything and made it of the correct material so that it wouldn't abrade the flip grip in, in, in shipping, uh, you know, including the, the credit card and the, or the credit card, the, the instructional card and the sticker and then packaging all those up. Um, yeah, totally. Cody, you get it. Um, here's a picture of me with one, just one of the many, many giant crates full of flip grips that we shipped out. Um, I also, uh, for some of the friends that I, that I, I, you know, I actually went and I 
I was one of the people packaging them. So I was really involved with the whole process. <laughs> I was also packaging them and taping them to be shipped out. And so every once in a while I would find one that was my friend's and uh, I would say, hey, I'm gonna draw a little picture on it. So here's one for my friend, uh, Anna, who loves, uh, who loves Yoshi. And so I drew a little Yoshi for her from memory. Can you believe it? Love Mike Choi with a little egg in the back. So uh, yeah, those Yoshi eyes, I know, I know. John, I mean, look, I learned from the best, okay, John? <laughs> Here's a weird picture of me with a forklift with a bunch of flip grips on it. Um, my hair is really weird in this picture. Uh, but this is forklift. So this was shipping flip grips out to people. Um, it was a lot of flip grips. And uh, what's up, friends? Um, and uh, I don't know. It was a huge success. Like people loved it, uh, generally speaking, I think. And um, it was it was a, one of the most gratifying experiences of my entire life to to be able to ship something out like this. Um, and of course, I didn't do it all by myself. I had so much help and support from Fangamer and from Jeremy um, and from, of course, all the Kickstarter backers and, and um, you know, everyone. Um, but uh, it was it's one of the proudest achievements of my life to be able to sh ship something like this and, and to have it go into people's hands. Um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, that's almost the end of the talk. I have a couple more things. Um, here's a picture of Tony and Amanda's cat. This was during one of the flip grip visits to, to Arizona. I was just going through all these old pictures, um, going through all these old pictures of, uh, of the development of flip grip. I stumbled upon a lot of pictures of just hanging out with the fan gamer folk and it made me very uh, nostalgic for those times. And so, yeah, look at that, look at that. So cute. Um, this is me and Jeremy celebrating um, the shipment of flip grip. I look really weird in this picture. <laughs> uh, but this is us celebrating. Uh, we met up after, after this was all said and done. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, that's pretty much, the, that's pretty much the story of flip grip. There's, there's some more stuff, but I won't go into too much detail, especially cause I'm running out of time. Um, I went to Japan late last year and I saw this, which honestly terrified me. Uh, I thought that Japan had released a flip grip competitor. But it turns out they just wanted to package their uh, switch case like this. But when I first saw this, it was a Yodobashi camera and I was terrified. I thought that this was a real, I thought this was a flip grip competitor and I was like, oh no, we have a competitor now, which we don't. Spoiler alert. Um, as far as I know, Mike looks really weird in every picture. <laughs> uh, and uh, Lindsay replied to my tweet about this with this, he's coming for you, Flippy which is their, their mascot, which I got to say, their mascot's pretty great. But I think they packaged it, I think they packaged it this way, <clears throat> excuse me, I think they packaged it this way um, to make it so that it was uh, easier to sit on a shelf. The Magic Dimension isn't my secret sauce though, right? <clears throat> because unless you know what it is, it, other than that, it's just manufacturing best practices. That's the other thing that I want to emphasize. Like, it seems like I'm going into a ton of detail here, but the thing is, unless you're a professional, you won't be able to do this. Like, I don't mean that as a flex, but like from this presentation, I gather, you will not be able to go and easily make a flip group competitor without an enormous amount of work. It's not just a matter of just copying what I have in this presentation. And so I don't think I'd give away any secret sauce here. I just kind of give a little bit of a look into kind of how it was developed. Um, all this to say that like, you know, uh, this, I, I, I think there's a lot of things about the flip group that I learned insights that I think um, for me, they're, they're gonna stick with me for a long time um, around like flexible design, um, thinking about variability, thinking about building less faster, all these sorts of lessons that I learned um, that I think can be applied up the chain to lots of different types of products. Um, maybe you're watching this and you've never thought about making things before. And so this is kind of hopefully a, a nice taste of what it's like to actually mass manufacture things, a little bit of a deep dive, sort of like a how it's made. Um, maybe you're thinking about making your own product and now you know a little bit more about how complex it can be and all the unexpected things that can happen. Um, 
yeah, maybe you're maybe you're interested in engineering or you're interested in, in manufacturing or something like that. And in which case, this is kind of a look into what it is actually like, like what is what is it actually like to make something? Yes, I did this on the side, but this is like this is a job like people do this to get paid money. And so this is what uh, this is what like a career in in in, in um, product design engineering is, is like. Um, and also it, it just kind of gives you some perspective as to like all the things that go into making a product and you know maybe i think most careers you focus enough that you don't actually have to think about a lot of these other things for me this is a really unique experience because i get to focus on everything i get to be a part of the entire process from idea all the way to actually taping them and mailing them out um and everything in between and so that was really cool for me um yeah and that's that's pretty much it i i, I got i got one more thing which is that um i'm not gonna okay first of all the entire premise of this presentation all comes down to following you're wrong <laughs> that's not what i'm saying but this was really hard <laughs> um i think like speaking personally the flip grip is was for me it was a, a big it was like a big achievement for me and i was really proud of it but i'm not raring to make a new product at scale in my spare time this, like I said before, this was like a ton of late nights, uh, staying until three, four, five in the morning, just by myself, designing this thing, talking to vendors, um, pouring over every detail. And um, there's still stuff that I would have done differently if I could go back in time. But I mean, it was it, it was an enormous amount of work, enormous amount of work. Um, one of the really cool things that came out of it after, after kind of going through and producing it um, we actually were able to do a special edition. We had a lot of different ideas for special editions, but one of them was for Downwell, which for me, when we received that email, when I received that email from Reed and Jeremy, Downwell was one of the first games that came to mind. If you don't know what Downwell is, it's a vertical shooter. It's, it's really, really fun. It was on mobile and it could really, I just, I loved it, but I felt like it could really benefit from physical controls. And so when I, when I, first saw that i i was super when, when i first uh, started thinking about the flipper i was like man down will be so interesting and so cool on this on this uh, accessory um but there was no announcement about it there was no there was no uh talk of it coming to the switch and then during the development it was during flip Grip's development it was eventually announced that down will be coming out and then we found out that they wanted to do a special edition downwell uh flip grip and so i went through some parts of this process again to make one that has a red nub instead of an orange nub and then it was uh, bundled with a physical copy of downwell which was released as a special edition through special reserve games um, a couple months ago and so that was really really exciting and kind of a a huge uh, that was that was a huge dream country for me i mean um i think there's something about downwell being developed by basically one person um and for me i uh, or, uh Moppin, the developer I, I just have a ton of respect for him and I just think Down was one of the coolest games. And so for me, um, it was really cool to be an independent accessory developer in this situation, making, um, you know, making an accessory that would pair with something like that. And so, I don't know, that for me was really, really cool. Um, yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's the talk, y'all. I have 15 minutes left, <clears throat> um, so I'm not going to be able to get to this live controller teardown. I hope you enjoyed that. Um, I worked really hard on this presentation. Uh, I know it's not done. It wasn't like the most cohesive presentation ever, but I appreciate you being patient with me as I stumble through some of these things. And um, yeah, thanks everyone. <laughs> I missed all that. Can you repeat it again? Um, so I can take questions. Uh, in the meantime. Let's, uh, let's look through some other things. Um, this is just me being silly, but, uh, you know, Flipgrip ends up being a very nice platform to, uh, manipulate switches spatially, uh, and make them do weird things. In this situation, uh, I took two switches and I made a fake new Nintendo Switch DS, which it is completely fake. It's not real at all. 
and I worked very hard to make a video that made it look like sort of like it was real, but it, honestly, I didn't do that good of a job. Um, let's uh, let's watch this video. Here. So it's t whoops, it's two uh, it's two flip grips bolted together with a with a with a hinge. So I have two instances of. Here, I'll let you. I'll, I'll let the video finish. This goes to show you. This is really just an example of of how I lost my mind during the development of flip grip, and so I started to make crazy things like this to to make myself laugh. Um, I also did this. This was before Brain Age was announced for the Switch. Oh my goodness, that's loud. Let's turn now. This took so long to make, and it's fake. It's completely fake. It's not real. But hopefully I've convinced you that I do actually make real things and not just fake things. You can you can see that I you can see that I'm, I'm faking the calculations. Um, Um, <laughs> uh, I'm doing this for the Twitter clout. It's not real. Three months later, Kickstarter. <laughs> it is fake. Um, if you want to know how I did that, I for this for this video. Here, I'm going to turn down the volume now. For this video, I uh, actually had two instances of Breath of the Wild running on two separate switches, and then I off the side of the screen, I had two Joy-Cons and I was rotating them, and then I recorded them both and then put them on the two screens. The funny thing about these videos is, yes, they're fake. I made them for the lulls, but the reactions to them, I think, are the funniest part because sometimes people, there's some people who think it's real, which is fine. I mean, that means maybe I did a good job. There's some people who think it's fake and they say that's fake and they say, ha, that's really funny. And then there's this third group of people that thinks that I'm trying to, or that, that thinks it's real or that I, or, or, and, and really tries to, uh, really gets upset. <laughs> They're like, this is fake. You're dumb. This is so stupid. And like, it's, it's just, it's really funny. Um, but you know, that's just cause I'm being dumb. Uh, and then this one was actually two videos um, of me actually playing real Brain Age and then redoing the calculations. So it's, there's actually not actual touch happening between this pen and the screen. This is actually not even a capacitive pen. Uh, I'm just remembering exactly when I touched the buttons and trying to make it look like I'm actually playing. Um, also, there's 32 by 9 switch adapter, which was a dare from Mark McDonald and Reed Young um, during the development of Flip Grip to make a adapter that could connect two switches. Why? Why not is really the answer. Look at that. So that's just some of the dumb stuff that I've made. Um, you know those switches that are like double switches? <laughs> yeah, this is pretty dumb. Anyway, um, I saw John ask, what do I do for my real job? What kind of stuff do I make for my real job? So um, my for my real job, I make, I make lots of different types of things. Um, I, you know, it's primarily consumer electronics focused. So it's, it's, Honestly, it's not that different from um, like something like, let's say, oh, I don't know. Let's see here. Uh, where do I have that graphic? 
here, this one, it's not that different from something like this. Like something that has a mechanical aspect, um, an electrical aspect, um, a, uh, you know, some more fancy stuff going on on the inside. This is the kind of stuff that I make for my day job. Not Flowgrip 2.0, obviously. Um, but like uh, integrated electronics. I'm trying to think of products that I've worked on that I could talk about. A lot of it's NDA. A lot of it I can't talk about. Um, because, uh, yeah, that's that's just the life of working as a consultant. I don't work for any particular company. I work for a company that works for other companies. And so, um, uh, yeah, I don't know. That's kind of how it is. <laughs> this is fake. You're dumb. So, yeah, I don't know. Are there any design changes you'd make to Flipgrip in retrospect? There are a lot, actually. Or there's not a lot, but there's actually a few. Um, I don't like the way that I implemented the ejection mechanism. I can't think of an immediate way that I would do it differently, but I wish that instead of a pull and then you pull out the switch, I wish it was a push. I wish you could push on it and then somehow make it so the switch would release. Figuring out a mechanism to do that was a little bit challenging. Um, I think what it would end up having to be is you like a, a lever that extends out from this cantilever comes up and then you push here and then the switch comes out. Um, but that's one, that's one of the major aspects that I would change, um, from, from, uh, from the original design, but doing that in a single piece of plastic is, is actually really challenging. Um, and so, yeah, I don't know. That's one thing that I would change if I could go back. It's, it's not entirely obvious how one would do that, but, um, yeah, if I could, if I could solve this problem again, I would probably do that differently. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. I think it was a little bit confusing. I think people see it and they think it's a button, so they press it. But yeah. Um, John asking, is it is it because it's unreleased or because I'm just not allowed to in perpetuity? Um, I don't know. NDAs are confusing. And so I generally just err on the side of never talking about the stuff that I work on. Um, but it's, you know, typically speaking, it's it's consumer electronic stuff. Um, a lot of medical devices. Oh, I worked on some, like, I worked on a lot of toys. Before I was at my last job, I was a toy designer. Um, and so I would I always do a lot of stuff like that. And so worked on some fun stuff there. Um, aside from Downhill, what are my favorite games to play with Flip Grip? Um, honestly, I'm really bad at most of the Flip Grip games. Like, most shmups, I'm really bad at. Uh, I really wish there was a Tate mode Tetris. Um, did I ever work on Bop It? Ooh, no, I did not. Um, I did work on a product though at one point that was very, very similar to Bop It. It was definitely trying to be like the Bop It of the future. Um, uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm really bad at shmups. I wish there were some easier Tate mode games. <laughs> um, I like Gunbird, I like Ikaruga. Downwell though is like definitely my favorite. I wish there was a Tate Tetris, that'd be so cool. Mike is my Nintendo uncle. Nice, Fino. Thanks for, hey, I just wanna say thank you to, uh, okay, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna spend the rest of my time thanking people. Um, thank you, first of all, for uh, thank you to, to uh, Fangamer for giving me the platform to tell this story. I think um, it's a really important story to me, how this console was developed, or how this product was developed. It's not a console. Uh, how this product was developed, it's, you know, it's really near and dear to my heart. I poured a lot of myself into this effort, enough so that I, I honestly felt like I was burnt out for a good chunk of time after I was done, just because I really, really put everything I could into it. Um, so I... I appreciate not just of course the opportunity i of course appreciate the opportunity to tell the story and then second of all of course i appreciate the opportunity to work on it at all right it wouldn't have happened if it wasn't for how um inviting and welcoming all the fan gamer uh people and community have been and you know i mean it just all goes back to them being so friendly um even online just like being friendly to to me and and uh, inviting them inviting me into their community um, and it's just a group of wonderful people. If, you, if you've ever met them or know any of them, you, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, and there's just too many people to name. Um, uh, you know, everyone has been so great to me. I mean, a lot of them are in chat. So I, pre I really appreciate that. Um, 
read. Thanks for the opportunity to work on it. Thanks for reaching out. I mean, it's honestly one of the coolest opportunities I've ever had to be able to work on something like this. Um, geez. Yeah. Um, thanks to all the people who showed up for the talk. Um, I actually have no idea where the viewership was at because uh, I wasn't looking at that on here. But if you're here, I appreciate you listening to the story. I appreciate you being patient with this very unrehearsed talk. You know, honestly, I want to take this further. I, this talk, I want to refine it. And this is the first time I'm giving it. This this opportunity, uh, which I really appreciate, by the way, Erica, you reaching out to me about it. Like, for me, it was the it was the impetus to actually be able to put this together. I've always wanted to. I've ever I've always wanted to put this together because I felt like. Um, and, and you'll actually see if you go through my hard drive, you'll see like other iterations of this talk. But this is finally the opportunity to be like, oh snap, I got to put it together. Um, and so I worked really hard on this. Oh my goodness, I worked so hard on this presentation. You, <laughs> I just want to play Animal Crossing. <laughs> I just want to play Animal Crossing when I was working on this presentation so much for the past week and a half. Um, yeah, I, I I really want to refine this more and 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 you know tell the story because I think. I don't know. I think there's I think there's a lot of fun fun aspects of this story that I, I hope resonate with people who aren't engineers or aren't interested in engineering. But it's just a fun story to tell about what it's like to develop hardware, uh, and especially just as like a dude, just a person in my room, you know. Um, and uh, yeah, oh my goodness, Mike missed out on 622 turn <laughs> I did, I did. Oh my goodness, Paul. <laughs> Message me and was like, hey, I have these crazy prices. I was like, oh, sweet. Oh, but I have to work on the presentation. So I wasn't able to go. Um, but yeah. You don't have a Switch and you enjoyed it. Well, I'm really glad to hear that, Colin. Thanks, everyone, for all the positive um, positive uh, feedback. Um, if you want to know more, if you want to learn more, you can find me on Twitter. You can find me on Twitch. Uh, I'm more than happy to talk about this stuff. You know, it's... It's uh, for me I'm, something that I'm really passionate about. I'm, I'm probably going a little bit over four now, right? Oh no, it's not four yet. I have 13 seconds left. Uh, I'm really passionate about uh, education. I don't know. I've always wanted. To, I've always wanted to um, use whatever platform I can to, um, you know, teach people about science and technology and engineering and all these sorts of things. And and um, I think this is a particular area that there's not a ton, there's not a ton of education around, you know. There's how it's made, and people think about that and and, and how things get made. Jeez, oh, such a bad sentence. Uh, but you know, I, I think um, I don't know. I think that uh, I, I I I know that I get a lot of purpose out of being able to teach people about stuff like this, and and it's it's really cool to me. So um, I appreciate the, the the platform to do that. Learn about Flipgrip and science. That's right, Holly. <laughs> um, yeah, I think, you know, this is... Uh, STEM education is about making things accessible to all kinds of different people. People who don't have background, um, people who um, might not know anything, you know? And um, I think this sort of stuff like product development and how things get made, it's, it's not really that accessible. You know, it's maybe an area... Of, there's lots of areas of STEM that are very inaccessible <laughs> but like this is i think something that um it, i'm glad that flip group is as simple as it is because i think people can actually wrap their minds around it but um you know once you actually talk talk about all the complexities and stuff like that i think it, it is quite interesting and, and there's a lot that you can learn from it sweet thanks so much carrie so oh if anybody ever complains about the price of Flipgrip, yeah, right? I don't know. I didn't mention that very much, but that's how we were able to make the Flipgrip so cheap. Is that, you know, we really pared down the, the prices and, and that was that was a big part of it, right? It's like making the Flipgrip accessible. Um, like, I think, I'll, I'll be honest with you. I get a lot of people who come up to me. Maybe I shouldn't say this on stream. Ah, that's fine. I get a lot of people who come up to me and they're like, why is this thing only $12? You should make it $30, you know? And you'd make up so much more money. And I think... First of all, I think people who say that they they they're, they're, they don't always know the full picture, but um, a lot of armchair entrepreneurs will tell me that, and I'll tell them no because then less people will buy it. <laughs> if the goal was to make vertical gaming on the go accessible, then it's like about making it at an accessible price. Um, and so I don't know. That's there's something there's something there about it. I mean, look, for me personally, 
I'll actually, I'll actually, like, if you go through and do the cost calculation of like how much time I spent on this and like the 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 uh, the amount of money that I'm supposed to be like my billing rate as an engineer or whatever, this was like, no, there's no way that this was a profitable venture for me. Like, there's no way that I could live off of Flip Grip or anything like that. Like, there's, there's just not a possibility. Um, for me, the value wasn't in, I know this sounds really cheesy, but for me, the value wasn't in the money that I was making from it, but from like being able to work with Fangamer and work with Jeremy and create this product and put this thing out into the world that people care about and that get people gets people excited. Like that to me was the cool aspect of Flip Grip and, and why I did it, not, not for the money, uh, which I know it sounds very cliche, but it's true. <laughs> Uh, if, you know, if I was doing flip for the money, then, uh, I'd be pretty dumb. <laughs> Cause we ain't greedy fool. That's right. You're a good man, Choily Brown. Thanks y'all. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Um, yeah, man. I, I can't end the stream on this slide. It's really, like, you know, it's Flipgrip 2.0 on stream. Oh my goodness. No, I didn't. No, I didn't. Um, but yeah, thanks everybody for tuning in. Uh, I guess I should do some plugs. So here, let's, let's end on this slide. Um, what am I cooking? What am I cooking? Is that like metaphorical cooking? Um, so... Over the past four or so months, oh, what am I making for dinner? I don't know what I'm making for dinner. I'm probably gonna get really hungry right after this is over because I only had a bowl of cereal. Um, what am I making for dinner? Hmm. Flipgrip pizza. I do have a frozen pizza. Um, I need more vegetables. Is anybody else experiencing this? Like I have plenty of frozen meats and stuff like that, but I'm running out of vet fresh vegetables. And so like I, as time goes on from getting, going to the grocery store, I no longer have fresh vegetables. I'm like, I can't really cook something that isn't just like meat lovers, whatever, because, uh, you know, I need more vegetables and I need to like go to the store and get them. Yeah. Vertical pizza. Pizza is a vegetable. That's right. I do have. Oh, I do have pizza. Shame pizza. No. Nah. I don't know what I'm gonna make. I'll probably do like a, a stir fry or something. What do I have in my fridge right now? I. You know, I have a lot of mushrooms and uh, like stuff to make sundubu. So like, spicy tofu stew. You know, members of the Korea house. They know what I'm talking about. Maybe I'll make some potato chip. Man, I miss all you fangamer people so much. Ugh. I don't know when the next time we'll be able to go out there is, but. <sighs> Stocked up on a bunch of freeze dried vegetables. See, that's the that's the that's the smart thing to do. That's the smart thing to do. Potato chip soup. Look, if you know, you know. Potato chip soup is the real deal. Alright. Shout out to Korea House. Hey, wait, here's a question. Uh, is Korea House going to be okay? Are they doing takeout? Have you all been getting t takeout from Korea House? This is what I want to know. I'm, I'm thinking about this, okay? There's lots of stuff that's very scary about COVID. I'm thinking about the small businesses. When things reopen, are, are they going to be able to survive this, you know? The small businesses and uh, small restaurants especially. I mean... Y'all, go get some takeout. Go get some takeout from Korea House. You know, just got to make sure it's still there. Man, it's so hot here. Um, yeah, I mean, you, you don't have to. I'm, I'm, I'm just saying, like, it might be a good idea if you want to go there after it's after it's all said and done. Um, yeah, yeah from Korea, in honor of Mike. You know, I think I told you this, but there's a restaurant very close to here called Korea House. And uh, my dad actually, uh, like, helped build the actual restaurant I, I might have mentioned that before I feel like I must have mentioned that before no I will you told me I have to 
I do. I do. You do have to. Um, all right. Plugs. I don't know. I don't know honestly who's watching this that isn't either from my community or from from the fan gamer community. But I stream on Twitch um, now. I don't do any. Of, I don't do any of this on Twitch. Like I don't talk about <laughs> product development on Twitch. Um, I stream piano. I play video game music on the piano, and sometimes I use stuff that I built, like little gadgets and widgets that I made to uh, enhance the experience. And so if you ever want to uh, check that out, please follow me, twitch.tv slash mechachoy. Mmm, KBBQ. Thanks, Alex. Hey, Alex, thanks so much for all the help today. Erica, thank you for letting me um, letting me postpone a week. I really appreciate that. As you can tell, like I did most of this in the past week, so I wouldn't have been able to finish it if, 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 if you didn't give me that extra time. So I really appreciate that. And I just appreciate the opportunity to do it. Thank you for reaching out. Oh my goodness. This is, this is so much fun. Amanda and Tony, I miss you. I was going through all the pictures and Carrie and Ryan too. I was looking through all these pictures of us just hanging out while I was working on flip grip. Ugh, I miss that. I miss that so much. Thank you for letting me stay at your house. <laughs> um, Steve, thank you for inviting me into, thank you for, for, for just inviting me into the fan gamer community and, and, I don't know that 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 moment it changed my life when I met you, and so I, re I really I really just can't thank you enough. Um, one day we'll meet in person. That's right. Oh jeez. So many people. So many other people that I have to thank too. Everdread, Jazzy. Oh my goodness, Jeremy, Everdread, Jazzy on it, like all the animations and all this stuff. Tony, you did the Flipgrip logo type, so good. All those other Flipgrip illustrations and all those beautiful graphics. Tony, I'm your, I'm, I miss you too as well. Look, I'm, I'm a fan. Uh, will I do the controller teardown in the stream? Yeah, maybe I will. You know, I have all the stuff ready for it. You know, what I was going to do, just as a preview, just as a preview of what I was going to do. So I was going to take, so this is, this is a, this is a, here, let me show you what I was going to do. So you see, this is the Joy-Con, right? Joy-Con buttons. They're gray and boring. Am I right? So I personally prefer uh, I don't have it on me at the time, but you know the new 3DS, right? The new Nintendo 3DS? It's got those amazingly colorful double shot buttons. That means that they're shot twice, once with the white plastic and once with the colored plastic. This is what they look like, okay? I got a couple of these. And one of my favorite things to do is to mod Joy-Cons with these buttons. Now, you might look at this and be like, oh wait, I've seen that before. I implore you to look again uh, because there, are, there are some aftermarket buttons that you can buy that are not double shot, they're just one color. So it's red, yellow, green, and blue. And they look all right, but I think that these double shot official Nintendo ones with like the little white accent and the little pastel touch it's just, you can't beat it. You really can't beat it. Granted, it is different from like the actual Super Famicom one. Um, but, so I love doing this mod. And uh, this mod is actually, it's, it's not as simple as just dropping the buttons in. You actually have to adapt them to the, uh, to the, to the, to the switch. Here, let me see if I can find it. Um... Here are some guts of a switch. Let's see, here we go. Thanks, Erica. Um, are they in here? No, they're not in here. Um, but anyway, like, gosh, I don't have them in here. Um, 
I can't find it. Um, but basically, you have to adapt the bottom of this button to the switch button. And so I actually designed this. Um, this is really hard to see what's going on here, but this is actually an adapter. And uh, it adapts to the bottom of the new Nintendo 3DS button and makes it so that it is compatible with the Joy-Con. So I designed these and uh, 3D printed them, as you can see here. And then it's a matter of putting it all together and then putting it inside of the putting it inside of the, uh, the switch, um, which you can actually see. Oh, look at that! I didn't actually I didn't actually do this uh, during stream, but like this this is some of the CAD for the flip grip. So this is the this is the 3D model of a flip grip, and then here is the design of the little adapter that connects the switch to the new Nintendo 3DS button. Just bought a flip grip. No idea why we didn't have one already, but we fixed it. Oh, thanks, Holly. I appreciate that. Thanks so much. Um, anyway, all right. I think I'm done. Uh, thanks, everybody. I'm if look. I'm I'm sorry in advance if you did something for flip grip and I didn't acknowledge it. I know that there's a lot of people. There's a lot of people involved. I just. I'm so grateful for the experience, and so I really appreciate anyone who had anything to do with it, you know, thank you. Um, all right. Mike, much more elegant solution than the other ones I've seen where people cut the bottoms of the switch buttons off and surgically attach them to new 3DS buttons. Thanks, Bearded. Thank you for acknowledging that. I actually did that for this one. I did that exact thing um, and found that it was, yes, exactly, it was very inelegant. Um, actually... Let me tell you how much I love doing this. I will go through great pains to make this happen because I did it on my Switch Lite as well. I mean, I think I just think that looks so. I just think that looks so cool. Anyway, this was very involved because to get to the Switch Lite buttons is oh, it is a pain in the butt. It is a, it is a pain. You have to remove the whole logic board. You have to reply the thermal paste. It's like, it's very much involved. As opposed to the Joy-Con, you just open up the Joy-Con. It's, it's very easy. Like at this point, I can open up a Joy-Con very, like very, very quickly. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah, some eye candy for you. I'm, I'm, really, in, I'm really into these buttons. I'm, I'm a huge fan, huge fan. Oh, I love them, I love them. Anyway, yeah, maybe, maybe for another stream I'll do that. Um, We'll see. Yeah, it looks really good on the yellow, right? I thought it would look a little bit weird with like this yellow being slightly different shade, but I think it looks actually really good. <sighs> My switch light. Yo, John, thank you for inspiring me with your art. I miss you, dude. I hope all is well. All right. Um, thanks, everybody. Uh, thanks, especially people who came from my community. Like, I appreciate that. <laughs> this is not what I usually talk about. And so I appreciate y'all showing up. Um, all right. I'm going to end stream now. But uh, thanks, Fan Gamer. Thanks, everybody. Have a good one. Have a good weekend. Happy Memorial Day. Bye.